Hello there everyone and uh, a very good evening to you all. Hope you had a happy Sunday and have done everything that you need to do so that you can relax and enjoy C.S. Lewis's The Magician's Nephew. When I did some research about the book for the introductory video that we did, it says that it's the sixth in the series, but in this edition it says, in reading order, The Magician's Nephew should be first. So, according to the publisher, this is the first book that we should be reading. So, I mean, yeah, if you guys know, tell me in the in the chat what, um, what order we should be reading these books. But hello there, Soul Sister, good evening. Scott Laidler, I'm glad you're looking forward to it. I am too. And Soul Sister's just finished Ready Player One. Was it the first time that you'd read it, uh, Soul Sister? Let me know. And hello there, Dark Fur, good evening to you. I'll just read the blurb quickly while we let some more stragglers come and join us and then we'll get right in to the story. It says here, it was one of the wettest and coldest summers for years when Diggory and Polly decided to explore the attic of the old tall house, and that is how they stumble upon the secret workroom of Diggory's eccentric Uncle Andrew, who, in a wild experiment, tricks them into vanishing right out of this world and into the enchanted land of Narnia. And that's where I think this is the first one, because it's the first time they go to Narnia but all will be made clear. As always, if you're enjoying Book Club and the live reads and all the bookish content, please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you've not done so, and consider sharing the show with your friends. It really helps us to grow and get more eyes and exposure to other people, so that's really helpful and is the best way to help the channel, and I appreciate every single share and every single uh, comment and view, really. I just love uh, doing these live reads. So, um, Neutrino. Neutrino has been away for a while and glad to be back. And I'm happy to have you back, Neutrino. Good to see you. Leanne says it, it is the first book. So, we've already read The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, which is uh, arguably the most popular in the series, but this is the, the prequel to that. Enough introduction for one book. Let's begin. The Chronicles of Narnia, The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis. Chapter 1 the wrong door. This is a story about something that happened long ago when your grandfather was a child. It is a very important story because it shows how all the comings and goings between our own world and the land of Narnia first began. Leanne, I think you're right. I'm sure you're right. In those days, Mr. Sherlock Holmes was still living in Baker Street and the B Bastables were looking for treasure in the Lewisham Road. In those days, if you were a boy, you had to wear a stiff Eton collar every day, and schools were usually nastier than now. But meals were nicer, and as for sweets, I won't tell you how cheap and good they were, because it would only make your mouth water in vain. And in those days there lived in London a girl called Polly Plummer. She lived in one of a long row of houses which were all joined together. One morning she was out in the back garden when a boy scrambled up from the garden next door and put his face over the wall. Polly was very surprised because up till now there had never been any children in that house, but only Mr. Ketterly and Miss Ketterly, a brother and sister, old bachelor and old maid, lived together. So she looked up full of curiosity. The face of the strange boy was very grubby. It could hardly have been grubbier if he had first rubbed his hands in the earth, and then had a good cry, and then dried his face with his hands. As a matter of fact, this was very nearly what he had been doing. Hi there, Julie. Welcome. Hello, everyone. It's so great to have you here, and thanks for coming. <clears throat> Hello said Polly. Hello, said the boy. What's your name? Polly, said Polly. What's yours? Diggory, said the boy. I say, what a funny name, said Polly. It isn't half so funny as Polly, said Diggory. 
Yes, it is, said Polly. No, it isn't, said Diggory. At any rate, I do wash my face, said Polly, which is what you need to do, especially after... And then she stopped. She had been going to say, she had been going to say, after you've been blubbing, but she thought that wouldn't be polite. All right, I have then, said Diggory in a much louder voice, like a boy who was so miserable that he didn't care who knew he had been crying. And so would you, he went on, if you'd lived all your life in the country and had a pony and a river at the bottom of the garden, and then been brought to live in a beastly hole like this. London isn't a hole, said Polly indignantly. But the boy was too wound up to take any notice of her, and he went on. And if your father was away in India, and you had to come and live with an aunt and an uncle who's mad, who would like that? And if the reason was that they were looking after your mother, and if your mother was ill and was going to... going to... to die, then his face went the wrong sort of shape as it does if you're trying to keep back your tears. I didn't know. I'm sorry, said Polly humbly. And then, because she hardly knew what to say, and also to turn Diggory's mind to cheerful subjects, she asked, Is Mr. Is Mr. Ketterly really mad? Well, either he's mad, said Diggory, or there's some other mystery. He has a study on the top floor, and Aunt Letty says I must never go up there. Well, that looks fishy to begin with. And then there's another thing. Whenever he tries to say anything to me at mealtimes, he never even tries to talk to her. She always shuts him up. She says, don't worry about the boy, Andrew, or I'm sure Diggory doesn't want to hear about that, or else, now, Diggory, wouldn't you like to go out and play in the garden? What sort of things does he try to say? I don't know. He never gets far enough. But there's more than that. One night, it was last night, in fact, as I was going past the foot of the attic stairs on my way up to bed, and I don't much care for going past them either, I'm sure I heard a yell. Perhaps he keeps a mad wife shut up there. Yes, I've thought of that. Or perhaps he's a coiner. Or he might have been a pirate, like the man at the beginning of Treasure Island, and be always hiding from his old shipmates. How exciting, said Polly. I never knew your house was so interesting. You may think it interesting, said Diggory, but you wouldn't like it if you had to sleep there. How would you like to lie awake listening for Uncle Andrew's step to come creeping along the passage to your room? And he has such awful eyes. That was how Polly and Diggory got to know one another. And as it was just the beginning of the summer holidays and neither of them was going to the sea that year, they met nearly every day. Their adventures began chiefly because it was one of the wettest and coldest summers there had been for years. That drove them to do indoor things, you might say, indoor exploration. It is wonderful how much exploring you can do with a stump of candle in a big house or in a row of houses. Polly had discovered long ago that if you opened a certain little door in the box-room attic of her house, you would find in the cistern and a, and a dark place behind it, which you could get into by a little careful climbing. The dark place was like a long tunnel with brick wall on one side and sloping roof on the other. In the roof there were little chunks of light between the slates. There was no floor in this tunnel. You had to step from rafter to rafter, and between them there was only plaster. If you stepped on this, you would find yourself falling through the ceiling of the room below. Polly had used the bit of the tunnel just beside the cistern as a smuggler's cave. She had brought up bits of old packing cases and the seats of broken kitchen chairs and things of that sort and spread them across the rafter and spread them across rafter to rafter so as to make a bit of a floor. Here she kept a cash box containing various treasures and a story she was writing and usually a few apples. She had often drunk a quiet bottle of ginger beer in there. The old bottles made it look more like a smuggler's cave. Hello there, Alex. What video game are you playing? <clears throat> Diggory quite liked the cave. She wouldn't let him see the story. But he was more interested in exploring. Look here, he said. How long does this tunnel go on for? I mean, does it stop where your house ends? No, said Polly. The walls don't go out to the roof. It goes on. I don't know for how far. Then we could get the length of the whole row of houses. So we could, said Polly. And, oh, I say, what? You could get into the other houses. Yes, and get taken up for burglars. No, thanks. Don't be so jolly clever. I was thinking of the house beyond yours. What about it? 
Why, it's the empty one. Daddy says it's always been empty ever since we came here. I suppose we ought to have a look at it then, said Diggory. He was a good deal more excited than you would have thought from the way he spoke, for, of course, he was thinking, as just as you would have been, of all the reasons why the house might have been empty so long. So was Polly. Neither of them said the word haunted, and both felt that once the thing had been suggested, it would be feeble not to do it. Hello there, Alam. Welcome. Shall we go and try it now, said Diggory. All right, said Polly. Don't, if you'd rather not, said Diggory. I'm game if you are, she said. How are we to know we're in the next house but one? They decided they would have to go out into the box room and walk across it taking steps, as long as the steps from one rafter to the next. That would give them an idea of how many rafters went to a room. Then they would allow about four more for the passage between the two attics in Polly's house, and then the same number for the maid's bedroom as for the box room. That would give them the length of the house. When they had done that distance twice, they would be at the end of Diggory's house. Any door they came to after that would let them into an attic of the empty house. But I don't expect it's really empty at all, said Diggory. What do you expect? I expect someone lives there in secret, only coming in and out at night with a dark lantern. We shall probably discover a gang of desperate criminals and get a reward. It's all rot to say a house would be empty all those years unless there was some mystery. Daddy thought it must be the drains, said Polly. Pooh! Grown-ups are always thinking of uninteresting explanations, said Diggory. Now that they were talking by daylight in the attic instead of by candlelight in the smuggler's cave, it seemed much less likely that the empty house would be haunted. When they had measured the attic, they had to get a pencil and do a sum. They both got different answers to it at first, and even when they agreed, I'm not sure they got it right. They were in a hurry to start on the exploration. We mustn't make a sound, said Polly, as they climbed in again behind the cistern, because it was such a an important occasion, they took a candle each. Polly had a good store of them in her cave. It was very dark and dusty and draughty, and they stepped from rafter to rafter without a word except when they whispered to one another, We're opposite your attic now, or this must be halfway through our house. And neither of them stumbled, and the candles didn't go out. And at last they came where they could see a little door in the brick wall on their right. There was no bolt or handle on this side of it, of course, for the door had been made for getting in, not for getting out. But there was a catch, as there often is on the outside of a cupboard door, which they felt sure they would be able to turn. Shall I? said Diggory. I'm game if you are, said Polly, just as she said before. Both felt that it was becoming very serious, but neither would draw back. Diggory pushed round the catch with some difficulty. The door swung open, and the sudden daylight made them blink. Then, with a great shock, they saw that they were looking not into a deserted attic, but into a furnished room. But it seemed empty enough. It was dead silent. Polly's curiosity got the better of her. She blew out her candle and stepped out into the strange room, making no more noise than a mouse. Hey, Christina. Likewise, welcome. How are you doing, all right? It was shaped, of course, like an attic, but furnished as a sitting room. Every bit of the walls was lined with shelves, and every bit of the shelves was full of books. A fire was burning in the grate. You remember that it was very cold. It was a very cold, wet summer that year, and in front of the fireplace, with its back towards them, was a high-backed armchair. Between the chair and Polly, and filling most of the middle of the room, was a big table piled with all sorts of things, printed books and books of the sort you write in, and ink bottles and pens and sealing wax and a microscope. But what she noticed first was a bright red wooden tray with a number of rings on it. They were in pairs, a yellow one and a green one together, then a little space, and then another yellow one and another green one. They were no bigger than ordinary rings, and no one could help noticing them because they were so bright. They were the most beautiful, shiny little things you can imagine. If Polly had been a very little younger, she would have wanted to put one in her mouth. The room was so quiet that you noticed the ticking of the clock at once, and yet, as she now found, it was not absolutely quiet either. There was a faint, a very, very faint humming sound. 
If hooves had been invented in those days, Polly would have thought it was the sound of a hoover. Oh, sorry, hooves. If hoovers had been invented in those days, Polly would have thought it was the sound of a hoover being worked a long way off, several rooms away and several floors below. But it was a nicer sound than that, a more musical tone, only so faint that you could hardly hear it. It's all right, there's no one here, said Polly over her shoulder to Diggory. She was speaking above a whisper now, and Diggory came out, blinking and looking extremely dirty, as indeed Polly was too. This is no good, he said. It's not an empty house at all. We'd better bunk before anyone comes. What do you think those are? said Polly, pointing at the coloured rings. Oh, come on, said Diggory, the sooner. He never finished what he was going to say, for at that moment something happened. The high back chair in front of the fire moved suddenly, and there rose up out of it, like a pantomime demon coming up, out of a trapdoor, the alarming form of Uncle Andrew. They were not in the empty house at all. They were in Diggory's house, and in the forbidden study. Both children said, Oh, and realised their terrible mistake. They felt they ought to have known all along that they hadn't gone nearly far enough. Uncle Andrew was tall and very thin. He had a long, clean-shaven face with a sharply pointed nose and extremely bright eyes and a great tuzzled mop of hair. Diggory was quite speechless, for Uncle Andrew looked a thousand times more alarming than he had ever looked before. Polly was not so frightened yet, but she soon was, for the very first thing Uncle Andrew did was to walk across the door of the room, shut it, and turn the key in the lock. Then he turned round, fixed the children with his bright eyes, and smiled, showing his teeth. There, he said, now my fool of a sister can't get at you. It was dreadfully unlike anything a grown-up would be expected to do. Polly's heart came into her mouth, and she and Diggory started packing, or story, started backing towards the little door they had come in by. Uncle Andrew was too quick for them. He got behind them and shut that door too, and stood in front of it. Then he rubbed his hands and made his knuckles crack. He had a very long, beautifully white fingers. Hello there, Diane Melobitz. We're reading The Magician's Nephew, and welcome to Book Club. If you're new here, be sure to go and uh, have a look at all of the audio books available. You're in for a treat if you've never been here before, so welcome. I'm delighted to see you, he said. Two children are just what I wanted. Please, Mr. Ketterly, said Polly. It's nearly my dinner time and I've got to go home. Will you let us out, please? Not just yet, said Uncle Andrew. This is too good an opportunity to miss. I wanted two children. You see, I'm in the middle of a great experiment. I've tried it on a guinea pig and it seemed to work, but then a guinea pig can't tell you anything, and you can't explain to it how to come back. Look here, Uncle Andrew, said Diggory, it really is dinner time and they'll be looking for us in a moment. You must let us out. Must, said Uncle Andrew. Diggory and Polly glanced at one another. They dared not say anything, but the glances meant, isn't this dreadful and we must humour him. If you let us go for our dinner now, said Polly, we could come back after dinner. Ah, but how do I know that you would, said Uncle Andrew, with a culling smile. Then he seemed to change his mind. Well, well, he said, if you really must go, I suppose you must. I can't expect two youngsters like you to find it much fun talking to an old buffer like me. He sighed and went on. You've no idea how lonely I sometimes am. But no matter, go to your dinner. But I must give you a present before you go. It's not every day that I see a little girl in my dingy old study, especially, if I may say so, such a very attractive young lady as yourself. <laughs> Polly began to think he might not really be mad after all. Wouldn't you like a ring, my dear? said Uncle Andrew to Polly. Do you mean one of those lovely yellow or green ones? said Polly. How lovely! Not a green one, said Uncle Andrew. I'm afraid I can't give the green ones away, but I'd be delighted to give you any of the yellow ones with my love. Come and try one on. Polly had now quite got over her fright and felt sure that the old gentleman was not mad, and there was certainly something strangely attractive about those bright rings. She moved over to the tray. Why, I declare, she said, that humming noise gets louder here. It's almost as if the rings were making it. 
"'What a funny fancy, my dear,' said Uncle Andrew with a laugh. It sounded a very natural laugh, but Diggory had seen an eager, almost a greedy look on his face. "'Polly, don't be a fool,' he shouted. "'Don't touch them!' It was too late. Exactly as he spoke, Polly's hand went out of to touch one of the rings, and immediately, without a flash or a noise or a warning of any sort, there was no Polly. Diggory and his uncle were alone in the room. Well said, Dark Fur. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> Chapter 2. Diggory and his uncle. It was so sudden and so horrible, unlike anything that had ever happened to Diggory, even in a nightmare, that he let out a scream. Instantly, Uncle Andrew's hand was over his mouth. "'None of that,' he hissed in Diggory's ear. "'If you start making a noise, your mother will hear it, "'and you know what her fright might do to her.' "'As Diggory said afterwards, "'the horrible meanness of getting at a chap in that way "'almost made him sick. "'But of course he didn't scream again. "'That's better,' said Uncle Andrew. "'Perhaps you couldn't help it. "'It is a shock when you first see someone vanish. "'Why, it gave even me a turn when the guinea pig did it the other night.' "'Was that when you yelled?' asked Diggory. Oh, you heard that, did you? I hope you haven't been spying on me. No, I haven't, said Diggory indignantly. But what's happened to Polly? Congratulate me, my dear boy, said Uncle Andrew, rubbing his hands. My experiment has succeeded. The little girl's gone, vanished right out of the world. What have you done to her? Sent her to, well, to another place. What do you mean? asked Diggory. Uncle Andrew sat down and said, well, I'll tell you all about it. Have you ever heard of old Mrs. Lefay? Wasn't she a great, a great aunt or something, said Diggory. Not exactly, said Uncle Andrew. She was my godmother. That's her there on the wall. Diggory looked and saw a faded photograph. It showed the face of an old woman in a bonnet, and he could now remember that he had once seen a photo of the same face in an old drawer at home in the country. He had asked his mother who it was, and mother had not seemed to want to talk about the subject much. It was not at all a nice face, Diggory thought, though, of course, with those early photographs, one could never really tell. Was there, wasn't there, something wrong about her, Uncle Andrew, he asked. Well, said Uncle Andrew with a chuckle, it depends what you call wrong. People are so narrow-minded. She certainly got very queer in later life, did very unwise things. That was why they shut her up. In an asylum, do you mean? "'Oh, no, no, no,' said Uncle Andrew in a shocked voice. "'Nothing of that sort, only in prison.' "'I say,' said Diggory, "'what had she done?' "'Ah, poor woman,' said Uncle Andrew. "'She had been very unwise. "'There were a good many different things. "'We needn't go into all that. "'She was always very kind to me. "'But look here, what has all this got to do with Polly? "'I wish you'd—' "'All in good time, my boy,' said Uncle Andrew. "'They left old Miss Le Fay out before she died, "'and I was one of the very few people "'whom she would allow to see her in her last illness. "'She had got to dislike ordinary, ignorant people, you understand. "'I do myself, but she and I were interested in, in the same sort of things. "'It was only a few days before her death "'that she told me to go to an old bureau in her house "'and open a secret drawer and bring her a little box that I would find there. The moment I picked up that box, I could tell by the pricking in my fingers that I held some great secret in my hand. She gave it me and made me promise that as soon as she was dead, I would burn it, unopened, with certain ceremonies. That promise I did not keep. Well, then, it was jolly rotten of you, said Diggory. Rotten? said Uncle Andrew with a puzzled look. "'Oh, I see. You mean that little boys ought to keep their promises? Very true, most right and proper.' I'm sure, and I'm very glad you have been taught to do it. But, of course, you must understand that rules of that sort, however excellent they may be for little boys and servants and women, and even people in general, can't possibly be expected to apply to profound students and great thinkers and sages. No diggery. Men like me, who possess hidden wisdom, are freed from common rules, just as we are cut off from common pleasures. Ours, my boy, is a high and lonely destiny.' <laughs> uh, 
As he said this, he sighed and looked so grave and noble and mysterious that for a second Diggory really thought he was saying something rather fine, but then he remembered the ugly look he had seen on his uncle's face the moment before Polly had vanished, and all at once he saw through Uncle Andrew's grand words. All it means, he said to himself, is that he thinks he can do anything he likes to get anything he wants. Hello there, um, a lumpy horse. Yes, it's a great line, isn't it? Ours is a high and lonely destiny. Reminds me of um, Mustafa Mond at the end of Brave New World as well. Of course, said Uncle Andrew, I didn't dare to open the box for a long time, for I knew it might contain something highly dangerous, for my godmother was a very remarkable woman. The truth is, she was one of the last mortals in this country who had fairy blood in her. She said there had been two others in her time. One was a duchess and the other was a charwoman. In fact, Diggory, you are now talking to the last man, possibly, who really had a fairy godmother. There, that'll be something for you to remember when you're an old man yourself. I bet she was a bad fairy, thought Diggory, and added out loud, But what about Polly? Hello, Andrew, Carter and Sonny. Welcome. How you do harp on that, said Uncle Andrew, as if that was what matters. My first task was, of course, to study the box itself. It was very ancient, and I knew, I knew enough even then to know that it wasn't Greek or Old Egyptian or Babylonian or Hittite or Chinese. It was older than any of those nations. Ah, that was a great day when I at last found out the truth. The box was Atlantean. It came from the lost island of Atlantis. That meant it was centuries older than any of the Stone Age things they dig up in Europe, and it wasn't a rough, crude thing like them either, for in the very dawn of time Atlantis was already a great city, with places and temples and learned men. <laughs> he paused for a moment as if he expected Diggory to say something, but Diggory was disliking his uncle more every minute, so he said nothing. Meanwhile, continued Uncle Andrew, I was learning a good deal in other ways. It wouldn't be proper to explain them to a child about magic in general. That meant that I came to have a fair idea what sort of things might be in the box. By various tests I narrowed down the possibilities. I had to get to know some, well, some devilishly queer people, and go through some very disagreeable experiences. That was what turned my head grey. One doesn't become a magician for nothing. My health broke down in the end, but I got better, and at last I actually knew. Although there was not really the least chance of anyone overhearing them, he leaned forward and almost whispered as he said, The Atlantean box contained something that had been brought from another world when our world was only just beginning. What? asked Diggory, who was now interested in spite of himself. Only dust, said Uncle Andrew, fine, dry dust, nothing much to look at, not much to show for a lifetime of toil, you might say. Ah, but when I looked at that dust, I took jolly good care not to touch it, and thought that every grain had once been in another world. I don't mean another planet, you know, they're part of our world, and you could get to them if you went far enough, but a really other world. Another nature, another universe, somewhere you would never reach, even if you travelled through the space of this universe forever and ever, a world that could be reached only by magic. Well, here Uncle Andrew rubbed his hands till his knuckles cracked like fireworks. I knew, he went on, that if only you could get it into the right form, the dust would draw you back to the place it had come from. But the difficulty was to get it into the right form. My earlier experiments were all failures. I tried them on guinea pigs. Some of them only died. Some exploded like little bombs. <laughs> Some exploded like little bombs. It was a jolly cruel thing to do, said Diggory, who had once had a guinea pig of his own. How do you keep getting off the point, said Uncle Andrew. That's what the creatures were for. I'd bought them myself. Let me see, where was I? Ah, oh, yes. At last I succeeded in making the rings, the yellow rings. But now a new difficulty arose. I was pretty sure now that a yellow ring would send any creature that touched it into the other place. But what would be the good of that if I couldn't get them back to tell me what they had found there? And what about them, said Diggory? A nice mess they'd be in if they couldn't get back. 
you will keep on looking at everything from the wrong point of view, said Uncle Andrew with a look of impatience. Can't you understand that the thing is a great experiment? The whole point of sending anyone into the other place is that I want to find out what it's like. Well, why didn't you go yourself then? Diggory had hardly ever seen anyone so surprised and offended as his uncle did at this simple question. Me? Me? he exclaimed. The boy must be mad. A man at my time of life and in my state of health to risk the shock and the dangers of being flung suddenly into a different universe? I never heard anything so preposterous in my life. Do you realise what you're saying? Think what another world means. You might meet anything. Anything. <laughs> "'And I suppose you've sent Polly into them,' said Diggory. "'His cheeks were flaming with anger now. "'And all I can say,' he added, "'even if you are my uncle, "'is that you've behaved like a coward, "'sending a girl to a place you're afraid to go to yourself.' "'Silent, sir!' said Uncle Andrew, "'bringing his hands down on the table. "'I will not be talked to like that by a little dirty schoolboy. "'You don't understand. "'I am the great scholar, the magician, the adept, "'who is doing the experiment.' Of course I need subjects to do it on. Bless my soul, you'll be telling me next that I ought to have asked the guinea pig's permission before I use them. No great wisdom can be reached without sacrifice, but the idea of my going myself is ridiculous. It's like asking a general to fight as a common soldier. Supposing I got killed, what would become of my life's work? Oh, do stop jawing, said Diggory. Are you going to bring Polly back? I was going to tell you when you so rudely interrupted me said Uncle Andrew, that I, did it, that I did at last find out a way of doing the return journey. The green rings draw you back. But Polly hasn't got a green ring. No, said Uncle Andrew with a cool smile. Then she can't get back, shouted Diggory, and it's exactly the same as if you'd murdered her. She can get back, said Uncle Andrew, if someone else will go after her, wearing a yellow ring himself and taking two green rings, one to bring himself back and one to bring her back. <laughs> hey, uh, Diane Melobitz, I'm really glad you, uh, yeah, you found a little treasure trove, I hope. <clears throat> and now, of course, Diggory saw the trap in which he was caught, and he stared at Uncle Andrew, saying nothing, with his mouth wide open. His cheeks had gone very pale. I hope, said Uncle Andrew, presently in a very high and mighty voice, just as if he were a perfect uncle who had given one a handsome tip and some good advice, I hope, Diggory, you are not given to showing the white feather. I should be very sorry to think that any one of our family had not enough honour and chivalry to go to the aid of um, a lady in distress. Oh, shut up, said Diggory. If you had any honour and all that, you would be going yourself. But I know you won't. All right, I've got to go. But you are a beast. I suppose you planned the whole thing so that she'd go without knowing it, and then I'd have to go after her. Hello there, sassy. Welcome. Of course, said Uncle Andrew, with his hateful smile. Very well, I'll go. But there's one thing I jolly well meant to say first. I didn't believe in magic till today. I see now it's real. Well, if it is, I suppose all the old fairy tales are more or less true. And you're simply a wicked, cruel magician like the ones in the stories. Well, I've never read a story in which people of that sort weren't paid out in the end. And I bet you will be, and serve you right. Of all the things Diggory had said, this was the first that really went home. Uncle Andrew started, and there came over his face a look of such horror that, beast though he was, you could almost feel sorry for him. But a second later he smoothed it all away, and said with a rather forced laugh, Well, well, I suppose that is a natural thing for a child to think, brought up among women as you have been. Old wives' tales, eh? I don't think you need worry about my danger, Diggory. Wouldn't it be better to worry about the danger of your little friend? She's been gone some time. If there are any dangers over there, well, it would be a pity to arrive a moment too late. I'm happy to hear that, Sassy. It's good to have you here. <clears throat> a lot you care, said Diggory fiercely, but I'm sick of this jaw. What have I got to do? 
You really must learn to control that temper of yours, my boy, said Uncle Andrew coolly. Otherwise you'll grow up like your Aunt Letty. Now attend to me. He got up, put on a pair of gloves, and walked over to the tray that contained the rings. <laughs> They only work, he said, if they're actually touching your skin. Wearing gloves, I can pick them up like this, and nothing happens. If you carried one in your pocket, nothing would happen. But of course, you'd have to be careful not to put your hand in your pocket and touch it by accident. The moment you touch a yellow ring, you vanish out of this world. When you are in the other place, I expect, of course, this hasn't been tested yet, but I expect that the moment you touch a green ring, you vanish out of that world and, I expect, reappear in this. Now, I take these two green rings and drop them into your right-hand pocket. Remember very carefully which pocket the green rings are in. G for green and R for right. G, R, you see? Which are the first two letters of green. One for you and one for the little girl. And now you pick up a yellow one for yourself. I should put it on your finger if I were you. There'll be less chance of dropping it. Diggory had almost picked up the yellow ring when he suddenly checked himself. Look here, he said. What about mother? Supposing she asks where I am? The sooner you go, the sooner you'll be back, said Uncle Andrew cheerfully. But don't really, but you don't really know whether I can get back. Uncle Andrew, Andrew shrugged his shoulders, walked across to the door, unlocked it, threw it open and said, Oh, very well then, just as you please, go down and have your dinner. Leave the little girl to be eaten by wild animals, or drowned, or starved in other world, or lost there for good, if that's what you prefer. It's all one to me. Perhaps before tea time, you'd better drop in on Mrs. Plummer and explain that she'll never see her daughter again, because you were afraid to put on a ring. By gum, said Diggory, don't I wish I was big enough to punch your head. <laughs> Diggory's feisty, isn't it, Doc? For he's not messing about. Then he buttoned up his coat, took a deep breath, and picked up the ring. And he thought then, as he always thought afterwards, that he could not decently have done anything else. <clears throat> Chapter 3 The Wood Between the Worlds Uncle Andrew and his study vanished instantly. Then, for a moment, everything became muddled. The next thing Diggory knew was that there was a soft green light coming down on him from above and darkness below. He didn't seem to be standing on anything or sitting or lying. Nothing appeared to be touching him. I believe I'm in water, said Diggory, or under water. This frightened him for a second, but almost at once he could feel that he was rushing upwards. Then his head suddenly came out into the air, and he found himself scrambling ashore, out onto smooth grassy ground, at the edge of a pool. <laughs> as he rose to his feet, he noticed that he was neither dripping nor panting for breath, as anyone would expect after being under water. His clothes were perfectly dry. He was standing by the edge of a small pool, not more than ten feet from side to side in a wood. The trees grew close together and were so leafy that he could get no glimpse of the sky. All the light was green light that came through the leaves, but there must have been a very strong sun overhead, for this green daylight was bright and warm. It was the quietest wood you could possibly imagine. There were no birds, no insects, no animals, and no wind. You could almost feel the trees growing. The pool he had just got out of was not the only pool. There were dozens of others. A pool every few yards, as far as his eyes could reach. You could almost feel the trees drinking the water up with their roots. This wood was very much alive. When he tried to describe it afterwards, Diggory always said, It was a rich place, as rich as plum cake. <laughs> I'm glad you're enjoying it, guys. It's a beautiful, um, a great C.S. Lewis fantasy adventure, and we're just getting started. The strangest thing was that, almost before he had looked about him, Diggory had half forgotten how he had come there. At any rate, he was certainly not thinking about Polly or Uncle Andrew or even his mother. He was not in the least frightened or excited or curious. If anyone had asked him, where did you come from, he would probably have said, I've always been here. That was what it felt like, as if one had always been in that place and never been bored, although he had never happened, or nothing had ever happened. 
As he said long afterwards, it's not the sort of place where things happen. Trees go on growing, and that's all. <laughs> After Diggory had looked at the wood for a long time, he noticed that there was a girl lying on her back at the foot of a tree a few yards away. Her eyes were nearly shut, but not quite, as if she were just between sleeping and waking. So he looked at her for a long time and said nothing, and at last she opened her eyes and looked at him for a long time, and she also said nothing. Then she spoke in a dreamy, contented sort of voice. "'I think I've seen you before,' she said. "'I rather think so too,' said Digree. "'Have you been here long?' "'Oh, always,' said the girl. "'At least, I don't know, a very long time.' "'So have I,' said Digree. "'No, you haven't,' she said. "'I've just seen you come up out of that pool.' "'Yes, I suppose I did,' said Digory, with a puzzled air. "'I'd forgotten. "'Then, for quite a long time, neither said any more. "'Look here,' said the girl presently. "'I wonder, did we ever really meet before? "'I had a sort of idea, a sort of picture in my head "'of a boy and a girl like us, living somewhere quite different "'and doing all sorts of things. "'Perhaps it was only a dream.' I've had that same dream, I think, said Diggory, about a boy and a girl living next door, and something about crawling among rafters. I remember the girl had a dirty face. Aren't you getting it mixed? In my dream it was the boy who had the dirty face. I can't remember the boy's face, said Diggory, and then added, Hello, what's that? "'Why, it's a guinea pig,' said the girl, "'and it was, a fat guinea pig, nosing about in the grass. "'But round the middle of the guinea pig there ran a tape, "'and tied on to it by the tape was a bright yellow ring. "'Look, look!' cried Diggory, "'the ring! "'And look, you've got one on your finger, and so have I.' "'The girl now sat up, really interested at last. "'They stared very hard at one another, trying to remember, "'and then, at exactly the same moment, she shouted out, "'Mr. Ketterly!' And he shouted out, Uncle Andrew! And they knew who they were and began to remember the whole story. After a few minutes hard talking, they had got it straight. Diggory explained how beastly Uncle Andrew had been. You're very welcome, guys. I tell you, I enjoy it uh, just as much. It's, it's not a chore for me reading this to you guys. I, I love it. I've never I've never read so much. So thanks. Thanks for being here. What do we do now, said Polly? Take the guinea pig and go home. There's no hurry, said Diggory with a huge yawn. I think there is, said Polly. This place is too quiet. It's so so dreamy. You're almost asleep. If we once give in to it, we shall just lie down and drowse for ever and ever. Hello, Google, Google. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> you guys are spoiling me with all the all the compliments. You're too kind. It's very nice here, said Diggory. Yes, it is, said Polly. But we've got to get back. She stood up and began to go cautiously towards the guinea pig. But then she changed her mind. We might as well leave the guinea pig, she said. It's perfectly happy here. And your uncle will only do something horrid to him if we take it back. What I've read on the channel, sassy or ever. And uh, if you've been at book club for a long time, you'll know um, favourite stories I'm not very good at. I need a top five. <laughs> I bet he would, answered Diggory. Look at the way he's treated us. By the way, how do we get home? Go back into the pool, I expect. They came and stood together at the edge, looking down into the smooth water. It was full of the reflection of the green, leafy branches. They made it look very deep. "'We haven't any bathing things,' said Polly. "'We shan't need them, silly,' said Diggory. "'We're going in with our clothes on. Don't you remember it didn't wet us on the way up? Can you swim?' "'A bit. Can you? Well, not much. I don't think we shall need to swim,' said Diggory. "'We want to go down, don't we?' Neither of them much liked the idea of jumping into that pool, but neither said so to the other. They took hands and said, one, two, three, go, and jumped. There was a great splash, and of course they closed their eyes. But when they opened them again, they found they were still standing, hand in hand, in the green wood, and hardly up to their ankles in water. The pool was apparently only a couple of inches deep. They splashed back onto the dry ground. 
"'What on earth's gone wrong?' said Polly in a frightened voice, but not quite so frightened as you might expect, because it is hard to feel really frightened in that wood. The place is too peaceful. "'Oh, I know,' said Diggory. "'Of course it won't work. We're still wearing our yellow rings. There, for the outward journey, you know. The green ones take you home. We must change rings. Have you got pockets? Good. Put your yellow ring in your left. I've got two greens. Here's one for you.' They put on their green rings and came back to the pool, but before they tried another jump, Diggory gave a long, Ooh, what's the matter, said Polly. I've just had a really wonderful idea, said Diggory. What are all the other pools? How do you mean? Okay, bye, Sassy, thanks for popping in. Lovely to see you. How do you mean? Why, if we can get back to our own world by jumping into this pool, mightn't we get somewhere else by jumping into one of the others, supposing there was a world at the bottom of every pool? But I thought we were already in your Uncle Andrew's other world or other place or whatever he called it, didn't you say? Oh, bother Uncle Andrew, interrupted Diggory. I don't believe he knows anything about it. He never had to pluck. He never had the pluck to come here himself. He only talked of one other world, but suppose there were dozens. You mean... This wood might be only one of them. No, I don't believe this wood is a world at all. I think it's just a sort of in-between place. Polly looked puzzled. Don't you see, said Diggory. No, do listen. Think of our tunnel under the slates at home. It isn't a room in any of the houses. In a way, it isn't really part of any of the houses. But once you're in the tunnel, you can go along it and come into any of the houses in the row. Mightn't this wood be the same? a place that isn't in any of the worlds, but once you've found that place, you can get into them all. <laughs> well, even if you can, began Polly, but Diggory went on as if he hadn't heard her. And of course, that explains everything, he said. That's why it is so quiet and sleepy here. Nothing ever happens here, like at home. It's in the houses that people talk and do things and have meals. Nothing goes on in the in-between places, behind the walls and above the ceilings and under the floor, or in our own tunnel. But when you come out of our tunnel, you may find yourself in any house. I think we can get out of this place into Jollywell anywhere. And we don't need to jump back into the same pool we came but by, or not just yet. The wood between the worlds, said Polly dreamily. It sounds rather nice. <laughs> Come on, said Diggory. Which pool shall we try? <laughs> Look here, said Polly. I'm not going to try any new pool till we've made sure that we can get back to the old one. We're not even sure if it'll work yet. Yes, said Diggory, and get caught by Uncle Andrew and have our rings taken away before we've had any fun. No thanks. Couldn't we just go part of the way down into our own pool, said Polly, just to see if it works. Then if it does, we'll change rings and come back up again before we're really back in Mr. Ketterly's study. Can we go part of the way down? Well, it took time coming up. I suppose it will take a little time going back. Diggory made rather a fuss about agreeing to this, but he had to in the end, because Polly absolutely refused to do any exploring in new worlds until she had made sure about getting back to the old one. She was quite, she was quite as brave as he about some dangers, wasps, for instance, but she was not so interested in finding out things nobody had ever heard of before, for Diggory was the sort of person who wants to know everything, and when he grew up he became the Professor Kirk, who comes into the other books. So any of you fans out there, I've never heard of um, Professor Kirk or Kirky. After a good deal of arguing, they agreed to put on their green rings. Green for safety, said Diggory, so you can't help remembering which is which, and hold hands and jump. But as soon as they seemed to be getting back to Uncle Andrew's study, or even to their own world, Polly was to shout, Change! And they would slip off their greens and put on their yellows. Diggory wanted to be the one who shouted change, but Polly wouldn't agree. <laughs> they put on the green rings, took hands, and once more shouted one, two, three, go. This time it worked. It was very hard to tell 
you what it felt like, for everything happened so quickly. At first there were bright lights moving about in a black sky. Diggory always thinks these were stars and even swears that he saw Jupiter quite close, close enough to see its moon. But almost at once there were rows and rows of roofs and chimney pots about them, and they could see St. Paul's and knew they were looking at London. But you could see through the walls of all the houses. Then they could see Uncle Andrew, very vague and shadowy, but getting clearer and more solid-looking all the time, just as if he were coming into focus. But before he became quite real, Polly shouted, Change! And they did change, and our world fell, faded away like a dream, and the green light above grew stronger and stronger, till their heads came out of the pool and they scrambled ashore. And there was a wood all about them, as green and bright and still as ever. The whole thing had taken less than a minute. <laughs> Where are we? There, said Diggory, that's all right. Now for the adventure. Any pool will do. Come on, let's try that one. <laughs> Stop, said Polly. Aren't we going to mark this pool? They stared at each other and turned quite white as they realised the dreadful thing that Diggory had just been going to do. For there were any number of pools in the wood, and the pools were all alike, and the trees were all alike, so that if they had once left behind the pool that led to our own world without making some sort of landmark, the chances would have been a hundred to one against their ever finding it again. Diggory's hand was shaking as he opened his penknife and cut out a long strip of turf on the bank of the pool. The soil, which smelled nice, was of a rich reddish brown and showed up well against the green. It's a good thing one of us had some sense, said Polly. Well, don't keep on gassing about it, said Diggory. Come along, I want to see what's in one of the other pools. And Polly gave him a pretty sharp answer, and he said something even nastier in reply. The quarrel lasted for several minutes, but it would be dull to write it all down. <laughs> Let us skip on to the moment at which they stood with beating hearts and rather scared faces on the edge of the unknown pool with their yellow rings on and held hands and once more said, One, two, three, go. <laughs> Splash! Once again it had worked, or oh, sorry, it hadn't worked. This pool too appeared to be only a puddle. Instead of reaching a new world, they only got their feet wet and splashed their legs for the second time that morning. If it was morning, it seems to always be the same time in the wood between the worlds. Blast and botheration, exclaimed Diggory. What's gone wrong? We've put our yellow rings on all right, he said, yellow for the outward journey. Now the truth was that Uncle Andrew, who knew nothing about the wood between the worlds, had quite a wrong idea about the rings. The yellow ones weren't outward rings, and the green ones weren't homeward rings, at least not in the way he thought. The stuff of which both were made had all come from the wood. The stuff in the yellow rings had the power of drawing you into the wood. It was stuff that wanted to get back to its own place, the in-between place. But the stuff in the green rings is stuff that is trying to get out of its own place, so that a green ring would take you out of the wood into a world. Uncle Andrew, you see, was working with things he did not really understand. Most magicians are. Of course, Diggory did not realise the truth quite clearly either, or not till later. But when they had talked it over, they decided to try their green rings on the new pool, just to see what happened. I'm game if you are, Polly said. But... She really said this because in her heart of hearts she now felt sure that neither kind of ring was going to work at all in the new pool, and so there was nothing worse to be afraid of than another splash, and I'm not quite sure that Diggory had not the same feeling. At any rate, when they had both put on their greens and come back to the edge of the water and taken hands again, they were certainly a good deal more cheerful and less solemn than they had been the first time. One, two, three, go, said Diggory, and they jumped. Mm-hmm. <laughs>
Chapter 4. The Bell and the Hammer There was no doubt about the magic this time. Down and down they rushed. First through darkness and then through a mass of vague and whirling shapes which might have been almost anything. It grew lighter, then suddenly they felt that they were standing on something solid. A moment later everything came into focus and they were able to look about the place. What a queer place, said Diggory. I don't like it, said Polly, with something like a shudder. What they noticed first was the light. It wasn't like sunlight, and it wasn't like electric light, or lamps, or candles, or any other light they had ever seen. It was a dull, rather red light, not at all cheerful. It was steady and did not flicker. They were standing on a flat, paved surface, and buildings rose all around them. There was no roof overhead. They were in a sort of courtyard. The sky was extraordinarily dark a blue that was almost black. When you had seen that sky, you wondered that there should be any light at all. <laughs> it's very funny weather here, said Diggory. I wonder if we've arrived just in time for a thunderstorm or an eclipse. I don't like it, said Polly. Both of them, without quite knowing why, were talking in whispers, and though there was no reason why they should still go on holding hands after they jumped, they didn't let go. The walls were, rose very high all around that courtyard. They had many great windows in them, windows without glass through which you saw nothing but black darkness. Lower down there were great pillared arches, yawning blackly like the mouths of railway tunnels. It was rather cold. The stone of which everything was built seemed to be red, but that might have only be because of the curious light. It was obviously very old. Many of the flat stones that paved the courtyard had cracks across them. None of them fitted closely together and the sharp corners were all worn off. One of the arched doorways was half filled up with rubble. The two children kept on turning round and round to look at the different sides of the courtyard. One reason was that they were afraid of somebody or something, looking out of those windows at them when their backs were turned. Do you think anyone lives here? said Diggory at last, still in a whisper. No, said Polly, it's all in ruins. We haven't heard a sound since we came. Let's stand still and listen for a bit, said Diggory. They stood still and listened, but all they could hear was the thump-thump of their own hearts. This place was at least as quiet as the wood between the worlds, but it was a different kind of quietness. The silence of the wood had been rich and warm. You could almost hear the trees growing and full of life. This was a dead, cold, empty silence. You couldn't imagine anything growing in it. Let's go home, said Polly. But we haven't seen anything yet, said Diggory. Now we're here, we simply must have a look around. I'm sure there's nothing at all interesting here. There's not much point in finding a magic ring that lets you into other worlds if you're afraid to look at them when you've got there. <laughs> lot, of, lot of chats going on here, I'm just checking up. Uh... <laughs> nope, nothing concerning me. Carry on, guys. Who's talking about being afraid, Polly said, letting go of Diggory's hand. I only thought you didn't seem very keen on exploring this place. I'll go anywhere you go. We can get away the moment we want to, said Diggory. Let's take off our green rings and put them in our right-hand pockets. All we've got to do is remember that our yellow are in our left-hand pockets. You can keep your hand as near your pocket as you like, but don't put it in or you'll touch the yellow and vanish. <laughs> they did this and went quietly up to one of the big arched doorways which led into the inside of the building and when they stood on the threshold and could look in they saw it was not so dark inside as they had thought at first it led into a vast shadowy hall which appeared to be empty 
But on the far side there was a row of pillars with arches between them, and through those arches there streamed in some more of the same tired-looking light. They crossed the hall, walking very carefully for fear of holes in the floor, or of anything lying about that, might, that they might trip over. It seemed a long walk. When they had reached the other side, they came out through the arches and found themselves in another, larger courtyard. <laughs> that doesn't look very safe, said Polly, pointing at a place where the wall bulged outward and looked as if it were ready to fall over into the courtyard. In one place a pillar was missing between two arches, and the bit that came down to where the top of the pillar ought to have been hung there with nothing to support it. Clearly the place had been deserted for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years. If it's lasted till now, I suppose it'll last a bit longer, said Diggory, but we must be very quiet. You know a noise sometimes brings things down, like an avalanche in the Alps. <laughs> it's another very good question, Sassy. Let me uh, finish the uh, the chapter and I'll give it some thought. <laughs> yeah, and it's going to be three books, I think, not one, but I'll give it some thought while we I'll finish the chapter first and then I'll address it. <laughs> they went on out of that courtyard into another doorway and up a great flight of steps and through vast rooms that opened out of one another till you were dizzy with the mere size of the place. Every now and then they thought they were going to get out into the open and see what sort of country lay around the enormous palace. But each time they only got into another courtyard. They must have been magnificent places when people were still living there. In one there had once been a fountain. A great stone monster with widespread wings stood with its mouth open, and you could still see a bit of piping at the back of its mouth, out of which the water used to pour. Under it was a wide stone basin to hold the water, but it was as dry as a bone. In other places there were the dry sticks of some sort of climbing plant which had wound itself round the pillars and helped to pull some of them down, but it had died long ago and there were no ants or spiders or any of the other living things you expect to see in a ruin, and where the dry earth showed between the broken flagstones there was no grass or moss. It was all so dreary and all so much the same that even Diggory was thinking they had better put on their yellow rings and get back to the warm, green, living forest of the in-between place when they came to two huge doors of some, some metal that might possibly be gold. One stood a little ajar, so of course they went to look in. Both started back and drew a long breath, for here at last was something worth seeing. For a second they thought the room was full of people, hundreds of people all seated and, and perfectly still. Polly and Diggory, as you may guess, stood perfectly still themselves for a good long time looking in. But presently they decided that, they, that what they were looking at could not be real people. There was not a movement nor the sound of a breath among them all. They were like the most wonderful waxworks you ever saw. This time Polly took the lead. There was something in this room which interested her more than it interested Diggory. All the figures were wearing magnificent clothes. If you were interested in clothes at all, you could hardly help going to see them, going in to see them closer. And the blaze of their colours made this room look not exactly cheerful, but at any rate rich and majestic after all the dust and emptiness of the others. It had more windows too, and was a good deal lighter. I can hardly describe the clothes. Their figures were robed and had crowns on their heads. Their robes were all crimson and silvery grey and deep purple and vivid green. And there were patterns and pictures of flowers and strange beasts in needlework all over them. Precious stones of astonishing size and brightness stared from their crowns and hung in chains round their necks and peeped out from the places where anything was fastened. Why haven't these clothes all rotted away long ago, asked Polly. Magic, whispered Diggory. Can't you feel it? I bet this whole room is just stiff with enchantments. I could feel it the moment we came in. Any one of these dresses could cost hundreds of pounds, said Polly. But Diggory was more interested in the faces, and indeed these were well worth looking at. 
The people sat in their stone chairs on each side of the room, and the floor was left free down the middle. You could walk down and look at the faces in turn. They were nice people, I think, said Diggory. Polly nodded. All the faces they could see were certainly nice. Both the men and women looked kind and wise, and they seemed to come out of a handsome race. But after the children had gone a few steps down the room, they came to faces that looked a little different. These were very solemn faces. You felt you would have to mind your P's and Q's if you ever met living people who looked like that. When they had gone a little further, they found themselves among faces they didn't like. This was about the middle of the room. The faces here looked very strong and proud and happy, but they looked cruel. A little further on, they looked crueler. Further on again, they were still cruel, but no longer looked happy. They were even despairing faces, as if the people they belonged to had done dreadful things and also suffered dreadful things. The last figure of the... Was, the last figure of all was the most interesting, a woman even more richly dressed than the others, very tall, but every figure in that room was taller than the people of our world, with a look of such fierceness and pride that it took your breath away. Yet she was beautiful too. Yet afterwards, when he was an old man, Diggory said he had never in all his life known a woman so beautiful. It is only fair to add that Polly always said she couldn't see anything specially beautiful about her. This woman, as I said, was the last, but there were plenty of empty chairs beyond her as if the room had been intended for a much larger collection of images. <laughs> hey, Rosie Brown. I'm glad you're uh, happy about the, uh, the book choice today. That's good to hear. I do wish we knew the story that's behind all this, said Diggory. Let's go back and look at that table sort of thing in the middle of the room. The thing in the middle of the room was not exactly a table. It was a square pillar about four feet high, and on it there rose a little golden arch from which there hung a little golden bell, and beside this there lay a, a little golden hammer to hit the bell with. I wonder, I wonder, said Diggory. There seems to be something written here, said Polly, stooping down and looking at the side of the pillar. By gum, so there is, said Diggory, but of course we shan't be able to read it. Shan't we? I'm not so sure, said Polly. They both looked at it hard, and, as you might have expected, the letters cut into the stone were strange. But now a great wonder happened, for, as they looked through the shape of the strange letters never altered, though the shape of the strange letters never altered, they found that they could understand them. If only Diggory had remembered what he himself had said a few minutes ago, that this was an enchanted room, he might have guessed that the enchantment was beginning to work. But he was too wild with curiosity to think about that. He was longing more and more to know what was written on the pillar, and very soon they both knew. What it said was something like this. At least this is the sense of it, though the poetry, when you read it, there was better. Make your choice, adventurous stranger, strike the bell and bide the danger, or wander till it drives you mad, what would have followed if you had. No fear, said Polly, we don't want any danger. Oh, but don't you see it's no good, said Diggory, we can't get out of it now. We shall always be wondering what else would have happened if we had struck the bell. I'm not going home to be driven mad, always thinking of that, no fear. Don't be so silly, said Polly, as if anyone would. What does it matter what would have happened? I expect anyone who's come as far as this is bound to go on wondering till it sends him dotty. That's the magic of it, you see. I can feel it beginning to work on me already. <laughs> well, I don't, said Polly crossly, and I don't believe you do either. You're just putting it on. That's all you know, said Diggory. It's because you're a girl. Girls never want to know anything but gossip and rot about people getting engaged. You look exactly like your uncle when you said that, said Polly. Why can't you keep, why can't you keep to the point, said Diggory. What we're talking about is how exactly like a man, said Polly in a very grown-up voice, but she added hastily in her real voice, and don't say I'm just like a woman or you'll be a beastly copycat. I should never dream of calling a kid like you a woman, said Diggory, Diggory, loftily. Oh, I'm a kid, am I? said Polly, who was now in a real rage. Well, you needn't be bothered by having a kid with you any longer than I'm off. 
I've had enough of this place, and I've had enough of you too, you beastly, stuck-up, obstinate pig. Deary me. None of that, said Digrin, a voice even nastier than he meant it to be, for he saw Polly's hand moving to her pocket to get hold of her yellow ring. I can't excuse what he did next, except by saying that he was very sorry for it afterwards, and so were a good many other people. Before Polly's hand reached her pocket, he grabbed her wrist, leaning across with his back against her chest, then, keeping her other arm out of the way with his other elbow, he leaned forward, picked up the hammer, and struck the golden bell a light, smart tap. Then he let her go, and they fell apart, staring at each other and breathing hard. Polly was just beginning to cry, not with fear, and not even because he had hurt her wrist quite badly, but with furious anger. Within two seconds, however, they had something to think about that drove their own quarrels quite out of their minds. As soon as the bell was struck, it gave out a note, a sweet note, such as you might have expected, and not very loud. But instead of dying away, it went on, and as it went on, it grew louder. Before a minute had passed, it was twice as loud as it had been to begin with. It was soon so loud that if the children had tried to speak, but weren't thinking of speaking now, they were just standing with their mouths open, they would not have heard one another. Very soon it was so loud that they could not have heard one another even by shouting, and still it grew, all on one note a continuous sweet sound, though the sweetness had something horrible about it, till all the air in that great room was throbbing with it, and they could feel the stone floor trembling under their feet. Then at last it began to be mixed with another sound, a vague, disastrous noise which sounded first like the roar of a distant train, and then like the crash of a falling tree. They heard something like great weights falling, finally with a sudden rush and thunder and a shake that nearly flung them off their feet, about a quarter of the roof at one end of the room fell in, great blocks of masonry fell all around them, and the walls rocked, the noise of the bell stopped. The clouds of dust cleared away, everything became quiet again. It was never found out whether the fall of the roof was due to the magic, or whether that unbearably loud sound from the bell just happened to strike the note, which was more than those crumbling walls could stand. There, I hope you're satisfied now, panted Polly. Well, it's all over anyway, said Diggory, and both thought it was, but they had never been more mistaken in their lives. Right, I'll answer this... Um question quickly from uh, Sassy, I think it was. Um, if you could read one book for the rest of your life, what would it be, Sassy says? And I'll uh, say it quickly. And of course, if you guys are subscribers, which you all should be, um, I, I'm not going to be able to pick one, as always. So I'm going to say three. And again, if it's one book for the rest of your life, then it has to be a big book. And so the biggest books I know would be Plato's Complete Works, the Bible, King James Version, or Gurdjieff's Beelzebub's Tales to His Grandson. They're all thousands and thousands of pages. And so if I only had one of those to read for the rest of my life, it would keep me occupied. I wouldn't get bored. So they're my top three. Okay, don't make me pick one, because I can't, but I will if I need to. Ch Chapter 5. The Deplorable World The children were facing one another across the pillar where the bell hung, still trembling, though it no longer gave out any note. Suddenly they heard a soft noise from the end of the room, which was still undamaged. They turned quick as lightning to see what it was. One of the robed figures, the furthest off one of all, the woman whom Diggory thought so beautiful, was rising from its chair. When it stood up, they realised that she was even taller than they had thought, and you could see at once, not only from her crown and robes, but from the flash of her eyes and the curve of her lips, that she was a great queen. She looked round the room and saw the damage and saw the children, but you could not guess from her face what she thought of either or whether she was surprised. She came forward with long, swift stride. "'Who has awakened me? Who has broken the spell?' she asked. "'I think it must have been me,' said Diggory. "'You?' said the Queen, laying her hand on his shoulder. A white, beautiful hand, but Diggory could feel that it was strong as steel pincers. "'You?' 
but you are only a child, a common child. Anyone can see at a glance that you have no drop of royal or noble blood in your veins. How did such as you dare to enter this house? <laughs> We've come from another world, by magic, said Polly, who thought it was high time the Queen took some notice of her as well as of Diggory. Is this true? said the Queen, still looking at Diggory, and not giving Polly even a glance. Yes, it is, said he. The Queen put her other hand under his chin and forced it up so she could see his face better. Diggory tried to stare back, but he soon had to let his eyes drop. There was something about hers that overpowered him. After she had studied him for well over a minute, she let go of his chin and said, You are no magician. The mark of it is not on you. You must be only the servant of a magician. It is on another's magic that you have travelled here. It was my Uncle Andrew, said Diggory. At the moment, not in the room itself, but from somewhere very close, there came first a rumbling, then a cracking, or sorry, a creaking, and then a roar of falling masonry, and the floor shook. There is great peril here, said the Queen. The whole palace is breaking up. If we are not out of it, in a few minutes we shall be buried under the ruin. She spoke as calmly as if she had been merely mentioning the time of day. Come, she added, and held out a hand to each of the children. Polly, who, who was disliking the Queen and feeling rather sulky, would not have let her hand be taken if she could have helped her. But though the Queen spoke so calmly, her movements were as quick as thought. Before Polly knew what was happening, her left hand had been caught in a hand so much larger and stronger than her own, so that she could do nothing about it. This is a terrible woman, thought Polly. She's strong enough to break my arm with one twist, and now that she's got my left hand, I can't get at my yellow ring. <clears throat> if I try to stretch across and get my right... <sighs> Excuse me. If I tried to stretch across and get my right hand into my left pocket, I mightn't be able to reach it before she asked me what I was doing. Whatever happens, we mustn't let her know about the rings. I do hope Diggory has the sense to keep his mouth shut. I wish I could get a word with him alone. The Queen led them out of the hall of images into a long corridor and then through a whole maze of halls and stairs and courtyards. Again and again they heard parts of the great palace collapsing, sometimes quite close to them. Once a huge arch came thundering down only a moment after they had passed through it. The Queen was walking quickly. The children had to trot to keep up with her, but she showed no sign of fear. Diggory thought, she's wonderfully brave and strong. That's what I call a queen. I do hope she's going to tell us the story of this place. She did tell them certain things as they went along. That is the door of the dungeon, she would say, or that passage leads to the principal torture chambers, or this was the old banqueting hall where my great-grandfather bared seven hundred nobles to a feast and killed them all before they had drunk their fill. They had rebellious thoughts. Hello there, Ahlam. Welcome. It's nice to have you. How are you finding your first live? Yeah, you're enjoying the story? They came at last into a hall larger and loftier than any they had yet seen. From its size and from the great doors at the far end, Diggory thought that now at last they must be coming to the main entrance. In this he was quite right. The doors were dead black, either ebony or some black metal which is not found in our world. They were fastened with great bars, most of them too high to reach and all too heavy to lift. He wondered how they would get out. The queen let go of his hand and raised her arm. She drew herself up to the full height and stood rigid. Then she said something which they couldn't understand, but it sounded horrid, and made an action as if she were throwing something towards the doors and those high and heavy doors trembled for a second as if they were made of silk and then crumbled away till there was nothing left of them but a heap of dust on the threshold. Whew! whistled Diggory. Has your master magician, your uncle, power like mine? asked the queen, firmly seizing Diggory's hand again. But I shall know later. In the meantime, remember what you have seen. This is what happens to things and to people who stand in my way. The more light 
much more light than they had yet seen in that country was pouring in through the now empty doorway, and when the Queen led them out through it, they were not surprised to find themselves in the open air. The wind that blew in their faces was cold, yet somehow stale. They were looking from a high terrace, and there was a great landscape out below them. Low down and near the horizon hung a great red sun, far bigger than our sun. Diggory felt at once that it was also older than ours, a sun near the end of its life, weary of looking down upon that world. To the left of the sun and higher up there was a single star, big and bright. Those were the only two things to be seen in the dark sky. They made a dismal group, and on the earth, in every direction, as far as the eye could see, there spread a vast city in which there was no living thing to be seen, and all the temples, towers, palaces, pyramids, and bridges cast long, disastrous-looking shadows in the light of that withered sun. Once a great river had flowed through the city, but the water had long since vanished, and it was now only a wide ditch of grey dust. Look well on that which no eyes will ever see again, said the queen. Such was charm, that great city, the city of the king of kings, the wonder of the world, perhaps of all worlds. Does your uncle rule any city as great as this boy? No, said Diggory. He was going to explain that Uncle Andrew didn't rule any cities, but the Queen went on. It is silent now, but I have stood here when the whole air was full of the noises of charm, the trampling of feet, the creaking of wheels, the cracking of the whips and the groaning of slaves, the thunder of chariots and the sacrificial drums beating in the temples. I have stood here, but that was near the end when the roar of battle went up from every street and the river of Charn ran red. She paused and added, all in one moment, one woman blotted it out for ever. Who? said Diggory in a faint voice, but he had already guessed the answer. I, said the queen, I, Jadis, the last queen, but the queen of the world. The two children stood silent, shivering in the cold wind. It's my sister's fault, said the queen. She drove me to it. May the curse of all the powers rest upon her forever. At any moment I was ready to make peace, yes, and to spare her life too. If only she would yield me the throne, but she would not. Her pride has destroyed the whole world, even after the war had begun. There was a solemn promise that neither side would use magic. But when she broke her promise, what could I do? Fool! as if she did not know that I had more magic than she. She even knew that I had the secret of the deplorable world. Did she think, she was always a weakling, that I would not use it? Hey, Shefki. Yeah, you are right. How you doing? What was it? said Digri. That was the secret of secrets, said the Queen Jadis. It had long been known to the great kings of our race that there was a word which, if spoken with the proper ceremonies, would destroy all living things except the one who spoke it. But the ancient kings were weak and soft-hearted and bound themselves and all who should come after them with great oaths never even to seek after the knowledge of that world. But I learned it in a secret place and paid a terrible price to learn it. I did not use it until she forced me to it. I fought to overcome her by every other means. I poured out the blood of my armies like water. Beast, muttered Polly. The last great battle, said the Queen, raged for three days here in Charn itself. For three days I looked down upon it from this very spot. I did not use my power till the last of my soldiers had fallen, and the accursed woman, my sister, at the head of her rebels, was halfway up those great stairs that led up from the city to the terrace. Then I waited till we were so close that we could see one another's faces. She flashed her horrible, wicked eyes upon me and said, Victory, yes, said I, victory, but not yours. Then I spoke the deplorable world. A moment later I was the only living thing, Beneath the sun. But the people, gasped Diggory. What people, boy? asked the Queen. All the ordinary people, said Polly, who'd never done you any harm, and the women, and the children, and the animals. Don't you understand? said the Queen, still speaking to Diggory. I was the Queen. They were all my people. What else were they? What else were they there for but to do my will? It was rather hard luck on them, all the same, said he. I had forgotten that you are only a common boy, 
How should you understand reasons of state? You must learn, child, that what would be wrong for you or for any of the common people is not wrong in a great queen such as I. The weight of the world is on our shoulders. We must be freed from all rules. Our, ours is a high and lonely destiny. Diggory suddenly remembered that Uncle Andrew had used exactly the same words, but they sounded much grander when Queen Jadis said them, perhaps because Uncle Andrew was not seven feet tall and dazzlingly beautiful. And what did you, and what did you do then, said Diggory? I had already cast strong spells on the hall where the images of my ancestors sit. And the forces of those spells were, and the force of those spells was that I should sleep among them like an image myself, and need neither food nor fire, though it were a thousand years till one came and struck the bell and awoke me. Was it the deplorable world that made the sun like that? asked Diggory. Like what? said Jadis. So big, so red, and so cold. It had all. It has always been so, said Jadis. At least for hundreds of thousands of years. Have you a different sort of sun in your world? Yes, it's smaller and yellower, and it gives a good deal more heat. The queen gave a long-drawn, ah, and Diggory saw on her face that same hungry and greedy look which he had seen on Uncle Andrew's. So, she said, yours is a younger world. She paused for a moment to look once more at the deserted city, and if she was sorry for all... The evil she had done there, she certainly didn't show it, and then said, Now let us be going. It is cold here at the end of all the ages. Going where? asked both, in, asked both the children. Where? repeated Jadis in surprise. To your world, of course. Polly and Diggory looked at each other aghast. Polly had disliked the Queen from the first, and even Diggory, now that he had heard the story, felt that he had seen quite as much of her as he wanted. Certainly she was not at all the sort of person one would like to take home, and if they did like, they didn't know how they could. What they wanted was to get away themselves, but Polly couldn't get at her ring, and of course Diggory couldn't, couldn't go without her. Diggory got very red in the face and stammered, Oh, 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 our world, I did, didn't know you wanted to go there. What else were you sent here for if not to fetch me, asked Jadis. I'm sure you wouldn't like our world at all, said Diggory. It's not her sort of place, is it, Polly? It's very dull. Not worth seeing, really. It will soon be worth seeing when I rule it, answered the Queen. Oh, but you can't, said Diggory. It's not like that. They wouldn't let you, you know. The Queen gave a contemptuous smile. Many great kings, she said, though thought they could stand against the house of Chan, but they all fell and their very names are forgotten. Foolish boy, do you think that I, with my beauty and my magic, will not have your whole world at my feet before a year has passed? Prepare your incantations, and take me there at once. This is perfectly frightful, said Diggory to Polly. Perhaps you fear for this uncle of yours, said Jadis. But if he honours me duly, he shall keep his life and his throne. I am not coming to fight against him. He must be a very great magician if he has found how to send you here. Is he king of your whole world, or only a part? He isn't king of anywhere, said Diggory. You are lying, said the queen. Does not magic always go with the royal blood? Who ever heard of a common people being magicians? I can see the truth, whether you speak it or not. Your uncle is the great king and the great enchanter of your world, and by his art he has seen the shadow of my face in some magic mirror or some enchanted pool, and for the love of my beauty he has made a potent spell which shook your world to its foundations and sent you across the vast gulf between world and world to ask my favour and to bring me to him. Answer me. Is that not how it was? Well, not exactly, said Diggory. Not exactly, shouted Polly. Why, it's absolute bosh from beginning to end. Minions, cried the Queen, turning in rage upon Polly and seizing her hair at the very top of her head where it hurts most. But in, doing, but in so doing, she let go of both the children's hands. Now, shouted Diggory, and quick, shouted Polly. 
They plunged their left hands into their pockets. They did not even need to put the rings on. The moment they touched them, the whole of that dreary world vanished from their eyes. They were rushing upward, and a warm green light was growing nearer overhead. Chapter 6 The Beginning of Uncle Andrew's Troubles Let go, let go, screamed Polly. I'm not touching you, said Diggory. Then their heads came out of the pool and once more the sunny quietness of the wood between the worlds was all about them and it seemed richer and warmer and more peaceful than ever after the stateless and or the staleness and ruin of the place they had just left. I think that if they had been given the chance, they would again have forgotten who they were and where they came from, and would have lain down and enjoyed themselves half asleep, listening to the growing of the trees. But this time there was something that kept them as wide awake as possible. For as soon as they had got out onto the grass, they found that they were not alone. The queen, or the witch, whichever you like to call her, had come up with them, holding on fast to Polly's hair. That was why Polly had been shouting out, let go. This proved, by the way, another thing about the rings which Uncle Andrew hadn't told Diggory because he didn't know it himself. In order to jump from world to world by one of those rings, you don't need to be wearing or touching it yourself. It is enough if you are touching someone who is touching it. In that way they work like a magnet, and everyone knows that if you pick up a pin with a magnet, any other pin which is touching the first pin will come too. Now that you saw her in the wood, Queen Jadis looked different. She was much paler than she had been, so pale that hardly any of her beauty was left, and she was stooped and seemed to be finding it hard to breathe, as if the air of that place stifled her. Neither of the children felt in the least afraid of her now. Let go, let go of my hair, said Polly. What do you mean by it? Here, let go of her hair, at once, said Diggory. They both turned and struggled with her. They were stronger than she, and in a few seconds they had forced her to let go. She reeled back, panting, and there was a, lo a look of terror in her eyes. Quick, said Diggory. Quick, Diggory, said Polly, change the rings into the home pool. Help, help, mercy, cried the witch in a faint voice, staggering after them. Take me with you. You cannot mean to leave me in this horrible place. It's killing me. It's a reason of state, said Polly spitefully, like when you killed all those people in your own own world. Do be quick, Diggory. They had put on their green rings, but Diggory said, Oh, bother, what are we to do? He couldn't help feeling a little sorry for the queen. Oh, don't be such an ass," said Polly. Ten to one, she's only shamming. Do come on. And then both children plunged into the home pool. It's a good thing we made that mark, thought Polly. But as they jumped, Diggory felt that a large cold finger and thumb had caught him by the ear. And as they sank down and the confused shapes of our world began to appear, the grip of that finger and thumb grew stronger. The witch was apparently recovering her strength. Diggory struggled and kicked, but it was not of the least use. In a moment they found themselves in Uncle Andrew's study, and there was Uncle Andrew himself, staring at the wonderful creature that Diggory had brought back from the world beyond. And well, he might stare. Diggory and Polly stared too. There was no doubt that the witch had got over her faintness, and now that one saw her in our own world with ordinary things around her, she fairly took one's breath away. In Charn she had been alarming enough, in London she was terrifying. For one thing, they had not realised till now how very big she was. Hardly human was what Diggory thought when he looked at her, and he may have been right, for some say there is giantish blood in the royal family of Charn. But even her height was nothing compared with her beauty, her fierceness and her wildness. She looked ten times more alive than most of the people one meets in London. Uncle Andrew was bowing and rubbing his hands and looking, to tell the truth, extremely frightened. He seemed a little shrimp of a creature beside the witch, and yet, as Polly said afterwards, there was a sort of likeness between her face and his, something in the expression 
It was not the look that all wicked magicians have, the mark which Jadis had said she could not find in Diggory's face. One good thing about seeing the two together was that you would never again be afraid of Uncle Andrew any more than you'd be afraid of a worm after you had met a rattlesnake, or afraid of a cow after you had met a mad bull. Pooh, thought Diggory to himself, him a magician, not much, now she's the real thing. Uncle Andrew kept on rubbing his hands and bowing. He was trying to say something very polite, but his mouth had gone all dry so that he could not speak. His experiment with the rings, as he called it, was turning out more successful than he liked. For though he had, for though he had dabbled in magic for years, he had always left all the danger. Excuse me, dabbled in magic for years, he had always left all the dangers as far as one can to other people. Nothing at all like this had ever happened to him before. Then Jadis spoke, not very loudly, but there was something in her voice that made the whole room quiver. Where is the magician who has called me into this world? Ah, uh, ah, uh, madam, gasped Uncle Andrew, I am most honoured, highly gratified, a most unexpected pleasure. If only I had the opportunity of making any preparations, I, I... Where is the magician, fool? said Jadis. I... I am, madam. I hope you will excuse any, uh, any liberty these naughty children may have taken. I assure you, there was no intention. You, said the queen in a still more terrible voice, then in one stride she crossed the room, seized a great handful of Uncle Andrew's grey hair, and pulled his head back so his face looked up into hers. Then she studied his face, as she had studied Diggory's face in the Palace of Charn. He blinked and licked his lips nervously all the time. At last she let him go, so suddenly that he reeled back against the wall. I see, she said scornfully, you are a magician of a sort. Stand up, dog, and don't sprawl there as if you were speaking to your equals. How do you come to know magic? You are not of a royal blood, I'll swear. Well, ah, uh, not perhaps in the strict sense, stammered Uncle Andrew. Not exactly royal, ma'am. The Ketterleys are, however, a very old family, an old Dorset, a Dorsetshire family, ma'am. Hi, Samantha. How you doing? Welcome. Peace, said the witch. I see you what you are. You're a little peddling magician who works by rules and books. There is no real magic in your blood and heart. Your kind was made an end of in my world a thousand years ago, but here I shall allow you to be my servant. I should be most happy, delighted to be of any service, a pleasure, I assure you. Peace! You took far too much. Listen to your first task. I see we are in a large city. Procure for me at once a chariot, or a flying carpet, or a well-trained dragon, or whatever is usual for royal and noble persons in your land. Then bring me to places where I can get clothes and jewels and slaves fit for my rank. Tomorrow I will begin the conquest of the world. I, I, I'll go and order a cab at once, gasped Uncle Andrew. Stop, said the witch, just as he reached the door. Do not dream of treachery. My eyes can see through walls and into the minds of men. They will be on you whichever way you go. At the first sign of disobedience I will lay such perils on you that anything you sit down on will feel like red-hot iron, and whenever you lie down in bed there will be invisible blocks of ice at your feet. Now go. The old man went out, looking like a dog with its tail between its legs. The children were now afraid that Jadis would have something to say to them about what had happened in the wood. As it turned out, however, she never mentioned it, either then or afterwards. I think, I think, and Diggory thinks too, that her mind was a sort of, was of a sort, I think, and Diggory thinks too, that her mind was of a sort which cannot remember that quiet place at all, and however often you took her there, and however long you left her there, she would still know nothing about it. Now that she was left alone with the children, she took no notice of either of them, and that was like her too. In Charn she had taken no notice of Polly till the very end, because Diggory was the one she wanted to make use of. Now that she had Uncle Andrew, she took no notice of Diggory. I expect that most witches are like that. 
They are not interested in things or people unless they can use them. They are terribly practical. So there was silence in the room for a minute or two, but you could, t but you could tell by the way Janice ta tapped her foot on the floor that she was growing impatient. Presently she said, t she said as if to herself, "'What is the old fool doing? I should have brought, I should have brought a whip!' She, st she stalked out of the room in pursuit of Uncle Andrew, without one glance at the children. "'Woo!' said Polly, letting out a long breath of relief. "'And now I must go home. It's frightfully late. I shall catch it.' "'Well do. Come back as soon as you can,' said Digory. "'This is simply ghastly, having her here. We must make some sort of plan.' "'That's up to your uncle now,' said Polly. "'It was he who started all this messing about with magic.' <clears throat> "'All the same, you will come back, won't you? "'Hang it all. "'You can't leave me alone in a scrape like this.' <laughs> "'I shall go home by the tunnel,' said Polly, rather coldly. "'That'll be the quickest way. "'And if you want me to come... Oh, "'Sorry, guys.' "'I shall go home by the tunnel,' said Polly, rather coldly. "'That'll be the quickest way. "'And if you want me to come back... "'Hadn't you better say you're sorry?' "'Sorry!' exclaimed Diggory. "'Well, now, if that isn't just like a girl, what have I done?' "'Oh, nothing, of course,' said Polly, sarcastically. "'Only nearly screwed my wrist off in that room with all the waxworks like a cowardly bully. "'Only struck the bell with the hammer like a silly idiot. "'Only turned back in the woods so that she had time to catch hold of you "'before we jumped into our own pool. That's all.' <laughs> oh, said Diggory, very surprised. Well, all right, I say I'm sorry. I, am re I really am sorry about what happened in the waxworks room there. I've said I'm sorry. And now do be decent and come back. I shall be in a frightful hole if you don't. I don't see what's going to happen to you. It's Mr. Ketterly who's going to sit on red-hot chairs and have ice in his bed, isn't it? It isn't that sort of thing, said Diggory. What I'm bothered about is mother. Suppose that creature went into her room. She might frighten her to death. Oh, I see, said Polly in a rather different voice. All right, we'll call it Pax. I'll come back if I can, but I must go now. And she crawled through the little door into the tunnel, and that dark place among the rafters, which had seemed so exciting and adventurous a few hours ago, seemed quite tame and homely now. We must now go back to Uncle Andrew. His poor old heart went pitter-pat as he staggered down the attic stairs, and he kept on dabbing at his forehead with a handkerchief. When he reached his bedroom, which was the first floor, he locked himself in, and the very first thing he did was to grope in his wardrobe for a bottle and a wine-glass, which he always kept hidden there where Aunt Letty could not find them. He poured himself out a glassful of some nasty grown-up drink and drank it off at one gulp. Then he drew a deep breath. Upon my word, he said to himself, I'm dreadfully shaken, most upsetting, and at my time of life. He poured out a second glass and drank it too. Then he began to change his clothes. You have never seen such clothes, but I can remember them. He put on a very high, shiny, stiff collar of the sort that made you hold your chin up all the time. He put on a white waistcoat with a pattern on it and arranged his gold watch chain across the front. He put on his best frock coat, the one he kept for weddings and funerals. He got out his best tall hat and polished it up. There was a vase of flowers put there by Aunt Letty on his dressing table. He took one and put it in his buttonhole. He took a clean handkerchief, a lovely one, such as you wouldn't buy today, out of the little left-hand drawer and put a few drops of scent on it. He took his eyeglass with the thick black ribbon and screwed it into his eye. Then he looked at himself in the mirror. Children have one kind of silliness, as you know, and grown-ups have another kind. At this moment Uncle Andrew was beginning to be silly in a very grown-up way. Now that the witch was no longer in the same room with him, he was quickly forgetting how she had frightened him, and thinking more and more of her wonderful beauty. He kept on saying to himself, A dem fine woman, sir, a dem fine woman, a superb creature. He had also somehow managed to forget that it was the children who had got hold of this superb creature. He felt as if he himself, by his magic, 
had called her out of unknown worlds. Andrew, my boy, he said to himself as he looked in the glass, you're a devilish, well-preserved fellow for your age, a distinguished-looking man, sir. You see, the foolish old man was actually beginning to imagine the witch would fall in love with him. The two drinks probably had something to do with it, and so had his best clothes, but he was, in any case, as vain as a peacock. That was why he had become a magician. He unlocked the door, went downstairs, sent the housemaid out to fetch a hansom, everyone had lots of servants in those days, and looked into the drawing-room. There, as he expected, he found Aunt Letty. She was busily mending a mattress. It lay on the floor near the window, and she was kneeling on it. "'Ah, Letty, Letitia, my dear,' said Uncle Andrew, I, "'I have to go out. Just let me five pounds or so. There's a good girl.' Girl was the way he pronounced girl. No, Andrew, dear, said Aunt Letty, in her firm, quiet voice, without looking up from her work. I've told you, times without number, that I will not lend you money. Now, pray, don't be troublesome, my dear girl, he said Uncle Andrew. It's most important. You will put me in a, deuce, a deucedly awkward position if you don't. Andrew, said Aunt Letty, looking him straight in the face, I wonder you are not ashamed to ask me for money. There was a long, dull story of a grown-up kind behind these words. All you need to know about it is that Uncle Andrew, with that managing dear Letty's business matters for her, and never doing any work, and running up large bills for brandy and cigars, which Aunt Letty had paid again and again, had made her a good deal poorer than she had been thirty years ago. "'My dear girl, said Uncle Andrew, "'you don't understand. "'I shall have some quite unexpected expenses today. "'I have to do a little entertaining. "'Come now, don't be tiresome.' "'And who, pray, are you going to entertain, Andrew?' "'asked Aunt Letty. "'A, a most distinguished visitor had just, has just arrived. "'Distinguished fiddlestick,' said Aunt Letty. "'There hasn't been a ring at the bell for the last hour.' "'At that moment the door was suddenly flung open.' Aunt Letty looked round and saw with amazement that an enormous woman, splendidly dressed with bare arms and flashing eyes, stood in the doorway. It was the witch. Oh, my. <laughs> oh. Sorry. <coughs> Went down the wrong hole. <laughs> <coughs> Chapter 7 <coughs> Oh dear. Chapter 7 What Happened at the Front Door <coughs> "'Now, slave, how long am I to wait for my chariot?' <laughs> thundered the witch. Uncle Andrew cowered away from her, now that she was really present, all the silly thoughts he had while he had had while looking at himself in the glass were oozing out of him. But Aunt Letty at once got up from her knees and came over to the centre of the room. "'And who is this young person, Andrew, may I ask?' said Aunt Letty in icy tones. "'Distinguished foreigner, the, the very important person,' he stammered. "'Rubbish,' said Aunt Letty, and then, turning to the witch, "'Get out of my house this moment, you shameless hussy, or I'll send for the police.' She thought the witch must be someone out of a circus, and she did not approve of bare arms. "'What woman is this?' said Jardis. "'Down on your knees, minion, before I blast you.' <laughs> "'No strong language in this house, if you please, young woman,' said Aunt Letty. Instantly, as it seemed to Uncle Andrew, the Queen towered up to an even greater height. Fire flashed from her eyes. She flung out her arm with the same gesture and the same horrible-sounding words that had lately turned the palace gates of Charn to dusk. But nothing happened except that Aunt Letty, thinking that those horrible words were meant to be ordinary English, said, I thought as much. The woman is drunk, drunk. She can't even speak clearly. 
It must have been a terrible moment for the witch when she suddenly realised that her power of turning people into dust, which had been quite real in her own world, was not going to work in ours. But she did not lose her nerve even for a second. Without wasting a thought on her disappointment, she lunged forward, caught Aunt Letty round the neck and the knees, round the neck and the knees, raised her high above her head as if she had been no heavier than a doll, and threw her across the room. Oh, dearie me, I didn't, didn't see that coming. While Aunt Letty was still hurtling through the air, the housemaid, who was having a beautifully exciting morning, put her head in at the door and said, If you please, sir, the ansoms come. Lead on, slave, said the witch to Uncle Andrew. He began muttering something about regrettable violence, must really protest, but at a single glance from Jadis he became speechless. She drove him out of the room and out of the house, and Diggory came running down the stairs, just in time to see the front door close behind them. Jimmy, or Jiminy, he said, she's loose in London, and with Uncle Andrew I wonder what on earth is going to happen now. Oh, Master Diggory, said the housemaid, who was really having a wonderful day. I think Miss Ketterley's hurt herself somehow. So they both rushed into the drawing room to find out what had happened. If Aunt Letty had fallen on bare boards or even on the carpet, I suppose all her bones would have been broken. But by great good luck she had fallen on the mattress. Aunt Letty was a very tough old lady. Aunts often were in those days. After she had had some sal volatile, and sat still for a few minutes, she said there was nothing the matter with her except a few bruises. Very soon she was taking charge of the situation. Sarah, she said to the housemaid, who had never had such a day before, go around to the police station at once and tell them there is a dangerous lunatic at large. I will take Mrs. Kirk's, Kirk's lunch up myself. Mrs. Kirk was, of course, Diggory's mother. When Mother's lunch had been sent to, Diggory and Aunt Letty had their own. After that he did some hard thinking. The problem was how to get the witch back to her own world, or at any rate out of ours as soon as possible. <clears throat> Whatever happened, she must not be allowed to go rampaging about the house. Mother must not see her, and, if possible, she must not be allowed to go rampaging about in London either. Diggory had not been in the drawing-room when she tried to blast Aunt Letty, but he had seen her blast the gates at Charn, so he knew her terrible powers and did not know that she had lost any of them by coming into our world, and he knew she meant to conquer our world. At the present moment, as far as he could see, she might be blasting Buckingham Palace or the Houses of Parliament, and it was almost certain that quite a number of policemen had by now been reduced to little heaps of dust, and there didn't seem to be anything... Um, <laughs> and there didn't seem to be anything he could do about that. But the ring seemed to work like magnets, thought Diggory. If I can only touch her and then slip on my yellow, we shall both go into the wood between worlds. I wonder, will she go all faint again there? there was there something the place does to her, or was it only the shock of being pulled out of her own world? But I suppose I'll have to risk that. And how am, I to find, how am I to find the beast? I don't suppose Aunt Letty would let me go out, not unless I said where I was going, and I haven't got more than two pence. I'd need any amount of money for buses and trams if I went looking all over London. Anyway, I haven't the faintest idea where to look. I wonder if Uncle Andrew is still with her. Yeah, I know. It's got to be one of the main rules, hasn't it, Rosie? Don't throw old ladies across rooms. <laughs> By the neck and the knees as well. <clears throat> it seemed in the end that the only thing he could do was to wait and hope that Uncle Andrew and the witch would come back. If they did, he must rush out and get hold of the witch and put on his yellow ring before she had a chance to get into the house. This meant that he must watch the front door like a cat watching a mouse's hole. He dared not leave his post for a moment, so he went into the dining room and glued his face, as they say, to the window. 
It was a, b a bow window from which you could see the steps up to the front door and see up and down the street, so that no one could reach the front door without your knowing. I wonder what Polly's doing, thought Diggory. He wondered about this a good deal as the first slow half hour ticked on. But you need not wonder, for I am going to tell you. But you need not wonder, for I am going to tell you. She had got home late for her dinner with her shoes and stockings very wet, and when they asked her where she had been and what on earth she had been doing, she said she had been out with Diggory Kirk. Under further questioning, she had said she had got her feet wet in a pool of water and that the pool was in a wood. Asked where the wood was, she said she didn't know. Asked if it was in one of the parks, she said truthfully enough that she supposed it might be a sort of park. From all of this, Polly's mother got the idea that Polly had gone off without telling anyone to some part of London she didn't know and gone into a strange park and amused herself jumping into puddles. As a result, she was told that she had been very naughty indeed and that she wouldn't be allowed to play with that Kirk boy any more if anything of the sort ever happened again. Then she was given dinner with all the nice parts left out and sent to bed for two solid hours. It was a thing that happened to one quite often in those days. So while Diggory was staring out of the dining room window, Polly was lying in bed, and both were thinking how terribly slowly the time could go. I think myself I would rather have been in Polly's position. She had only to wait for the end of her two hours, but every few minutes Diggory would hear a cab or a baker's van or a butcher's boy coming round the corner and think, here she comes, and then find, find it wasn't. And in between these false alarms, what seemed hours and hours, the clock ticked on, and one big fly, high up and far out of reach, buzzed against the window. It was one of those houses that get very quiet and dull in the afternoon, and always seem to smell of mutton. During his long watching and waiting, one small thing happened which I shall have to mention, because something important came of it later. A lady called with some grapes for Diggory's mother, and as the dining-room door was open, Diggory couldn't help overhearing Aunt Letty and the lady as they talked in the hall. "'What lovely grapes!' came Aunt Letty's voice. "'I'm sure if anything could do her good, these would. "'But poor dear little Mabel, I'm afraid it would need, it would need fruit from the land of youth to help her now. "'Nothing in this world will do much.' "'Then they both lowered their voices and said a lot more that he could not hear.' If he had heard that bit about the land of youth a few days ago, he would have thought Aunt Letty was just talking without meaning anything in particular, the way grown-ups do, and it wouldn't have interested him. He almost thought so now, but suddenly it flashed upon his mind that he, that he now knew, even if Aunt Letty didn't, that there really were other worlds and that he himself had been in one of them. At that rate, there might be a real land of youth somewhere. There might be almost anything. There might be fruit in some other world that would really cure his mother. And oh, oh well, you know how it feels if you begin hoping for something that you desperately want badly. You almost fight against the hope because it is too good to be true. You've been disappointed so often before. That was how Diggory felt. But it was no good trying to throttle this hope. But, but it was no good trying to throttle this hope. It might really, really, it might, it just might be true. So many odd things had happened already, and he had the magic rings. There must be worlds you could get, you could get to through every pool in the wood. He could hunt through, he could hunt through them all, and then mother well again. <clears throat> Everything right again. He forgot all about watching for the witch. His hand was already going into the pocket where he kept the yellow ring, when all at once he heard a sound of galloping. Hello, what's that? thought Diggory. Fire engine? I wonder what house is on fire. Great Scott, it's coming here. Why, it's her. I needn't tell you who he meant by her. First came the hansom. There was no one in the driver's seat. On the roof, not sitting, but standing on the roof, swaying with superb balance as it came at full speed round the corner, with one wheel in the air, was Jadis, the Queen of Queens, and the Terror of Charn. And I'll have to show you this picture, because it's quite funny. Um, there's the Queen. 
standing on top of the uh, the handsome, the hackney carriage, <laughs> riding it like some sort of skateboard thing. Her teeth were bared, her eyes shone like fire, and her long hair streamed out behind her like a comet's tail. She was flogging the horse without mercy. Its nostrils were wide and red, and its eyes were spotted with foam. It galloped madly up to the front door, missing the lamp post by an inch, and then reared up on its hind legs. The hansom crashed into the lamp post and shattered into several pieces. The witch, with a magnificent jump, had sprung clear just in time and landed on the horse's back. She settled herself astride and leaned forward, whispering things in its ear. They must have been things meant not to quiet it, but to madden it. It was on its hind legs again and in a moment, and its neigh was like a scream. It was all hooves and teeth and eyes and tossing mane. Only a splendid rider could have stayed on its back. Before Diggory had recovered his breath, a good many other things began to happen. A second hansom dashed up close behind the first. Out of it there jumped a fat man in a frock coat and a policeman. Then came a third hansom with two more policemen in it. After it came about twenty people, mostly errand boys on bicycles, all ringing their bells and let it out cheers and catcalls. Last of all came a crowd of people on foot all very hot with running, but obviously enjoying themselves. Windows shot up in all the houses of that street, and a housemaid or a butler appeared at every front door. They wanted to see the fun. Hey, Nicole, I'm glad you enjoy the readings. Uh, I've never heard of that one, but I'll be sure to look into it and get it into a poll soon, OK? <clears throat> Meanwhile, an old gentleman had begun to struggle shakily out of the ruins of the first hansom. Several people rushed forward to help him, but as one pulled him one way and another another, perhaps he would have got out quite as quickly on his own. Diggory guessed that the old gentleman must be Uncle Andrew, but you couldn't see his face. His tall hat had been bashed down over it. Diggory rushed out and joined the crowd. That's the woman! "'That's the woman,' cried the fat man, pointing at Jadis. "'Do your duty, constable. Hundreds of thousands of pounds worth she's taken out of my shop. "'Look at that rope of pearls round her neck. That's mine. "'And she's given me a black eye, too, what's more?' That's, "'That she has, governor,' said one of the crowd. And as, a, "'And as lovely a black eye as I'd wish to see. "'Beautiful bit of work that must have been. "'Gore, ain't she strong, then?' <coughs> You ought to put a nice raw beefsteak on it, mister. That's what it wants, said the butcher's boy. Now then, said the most important of the policemen, what's this here? I tell you, she, began the fat man when someone else called out, don't let the old cove in the cab get away. He put her up to it. The old gentleman, who was certainly Uncle Andrew, had just succeeded in standing up and was rubbing his bruises. Now then, said the policeman, turning to him, what's this? Wompful, pompy, shomph came Uncle Andrew's voice from inside the hat. <clears throat> okay. From inside the hat. "'None of that now,' said the policeman sternly. "'You'll find this is no laughing matter. "'Take that at office, see?' "'This was more easily said than done, "'but after Uncle Andrew had struggled in vain with the hat for some time, two other policemen seized it by the brim and forced it off. "'Thank you, thank you,' said Uncle Andrew in a faint voice. "'Thank you. Dear me, I'm terribly shaken. "'If someone could give me a small glass of brandy.' Now you attend to me, if you please, said the policeman, taking out a very large notebook and a very small pencil. Are you in charge of that there young woman? Look out, called several voices, and the policeman jumped a step backwards just in time. The horse had aimed a kick at him, which would probably have killed him. Then the witch wheeled the horse round so that she faced the crowd with its hind legs there on the footpath. She had a long, bright knife in her hand and had been busily cutting the horse free from the wreck of the handsome. 
All this time Diggory had been trying to get into a position from which he could touch the witch. This wasn't at all easy, because on the side nearest to him there were too many people, and in order to get round to the other side he had to pass between the horse's hooves and the railings of the area that surrounded the house, for the Ketterley's house had a basement. If you know anything about horses, and especially if you had seen what a state that horse was in at the moment, you will realise that this was a ticklish thing to do. Diggory knew a lot about horses, but he set his teeth and got ready to make a dash for it as soon as he saw a favourable moment. A red-faced man in a bowler hat had now shouldered his way to the front of the crowd. "'Hi, policeman,' he said. "'That's my horse.' what she's sitting on, same as this my cab that she's made matchwood of. One at a time, please, one at a time, said the policeman. But there ain't no time, said the cabbie. I know that horse better than you do. Tain't an ordinary horse. His father was officer's charger in the cavalry, he was. And if the young woman goes on hex sighting him, there'll be a murder done. Here, let me get at him. The policeman was only too glad to have a good reason for standing further away from the horse. The cabbie took a step nearer, looked up at Jadis and said in a not unkindly voice, Now, missy, let me get out its head, and just you get off. You're a liddy, and you don't want all these roughs going for you, do you? You want to go home and have a nice cup of tea and a lay down quiet like. Quiet like. Then you'll feel ever so much better. At the same time, she stretched out his he stretched out his hand towards the horse's head with the words, Steady, strawberry, old boy, steady now. Then, for the first time, the witch spoke. Dog! came her cold, clear voice, ringing loud above all the other noises. Dog, unhand our royal charger. We are the Empress Jadis. <laughs> you can always go back... Um, a lumpy horse. <laughs> and uh, hello there, Joel. Oh, no, yes, yeah, she just yeah, read it, lumpy horse. Should I do it again for you? Then, for the first time, the witch spoke. Dog, came her cold, clear voice, ringing loud above all the other horses. Dog, unhand our royal charger. We are the Empress Jadis. She's really quite rude, isn't she? Um, <laughs> in in our in our world, and guys, I think um, we're I think we're about halfway through the book, and so again, I've underestimated another another book and another read. I seem to be doing that a lot recently, so I'm going to read one more chapter. I'm going to read chapter eight, the fight at the lamp post. And then we're going to leave it for this evening and come back tomorrow and read the second half. And we'll start. It's a good place to start. Chapter 9 will be The Founding of Narnia. So sorry to disappoint anyone who thought we might get through the whole book. But yeah, it's going to be too late finishing and I might get tired towards the end. So last chapter for this evening and we'll be back for part 2 and the second half of the book tomorrow. Okay, guys, so sorry if I disappoint anyone, but that's the way it's going to go. So tomorrow we'll be back to finish it. Chapter 8, The Fight at the Lamp Post. Ho, oh, Empress, are you? We'll see about that, said a voice. Then another voice said, Three cheers for the Empress of Coniatch. And a quiet number joined in. A flush of colour came into the witch's face and she bowed ever so slightly, but the cheers died away into roars of laughter and she sure saw that they had only been making fun of her. A change came over her expression and she changed the knife to her left hand. Then without warning she did a thing that was dreadful to see. Lightly, easily, as if it were the most ordinary thing in the world, she stretched up her right arm and wrenched off one of the crossbars of the lamppost. If she had lost some magical powers in our world, she had not lost her strength. She could break an iron bar as if it were a stick of barley sugar. She tossed her new weapon up in the air, caught it again, brandished it, and urged the horse forward. Now's my chance, thought Diggory. 
He darted between the horse and the railings and began going forward. If only the brute would stay still for a moment, he might catch the witch's heel. As he rushed, he heard a sickening crash and a thud. The witch had brought the bar down on the chief policeman's helmet. The man fell like a ninepin. "'Quick, Diggory, this must be stopped,' said a voice beside him. It was Polly, who had rushed down the moment she was allowed out of bed. "'You are a brick,' said Diggory. "'Hold on to me tight. You'll have to manage the ring. Yellow, remember? And don't put it on till I shout.' There was a second crash, and another policeman crumpled up. There came an angry roar from the crowd. "'Pull her down! Get a few paving stones! Call out the military!' But most of them were getting as far away as they could. The cabbie, however, obviously the bravest, as well as the kindest person present, was keeping close to the horse, dodging this way and that to avoid the bar, but still trying to catch Strawberry's head. The crowd booed and bellowed again. A stone whistled over Diggory's head. Then came the voice of the witch, clear, clear like a great bell, and sounding as if for once she was almost happy. Scum! You shall pay dearly for this when I have conquered your world. Not one stone of your city will be left. I will make it as Charn, as Felinda, as Sorlois, as, as Bramandin. <laughs> Diggory at last caught her ankle. She kicked back with her heel and hit him in the mouth. In his pain he lost hold. His lip was cut and his mouth full of blood. Goodness me. Child abuse. <laughs> From somewhere very close by came the voice of Uncle Andrew in a sort of trembling scream. Madam, my dear young lady, for heaven's sake, compose yourself. Diggory made a second grab at her heel and was again shaken off. More men were knocked down by the iron bar. He made a third grab, caught the heel, held on like grim death, shouting to Polly, Go! Then, oh, thank goodness! The angry, frightened faces had vanished. The angry, frightened voices were silenced. All except Uncle Andrews, close beside Diggory in the darkness, it was wailing on. Oh, oh, is this delirium? Is this the end? I can't bear it. It's not fair. I never meant to be a magician. It's all a misunderstanding. It's all my godmother's fault. I must protest against this. In my state of health, too, a very old Dorset, a Dorset, Dorsetshire family. <laughs> yeah, I know. Getting serious, isn't it? She ain't messing about, the Queen, Queen Jadin. Beastly. Bother, thought Diggory. We didn't want to bring him along. My hat, what a panic. Are you there, Polly? Yes, I'm here. Don't keep on shoving. I'm not, began Diggory, but before he could say anything more, their heads came out into the warm green sunshine of the wood, and as they stepped out of the pool, Polly cried out, Oh, look, we've brought the old horse with us too, and Mr. Ketterly, and the cabbie. This is a pretty kettle of fish. As soon as the witch saw that she was once more in the wood, she turned pale and bent down till her face touched the mane of the horse. You could see she felt deadly sick. Uncle Andrew was shivering, but Strawberry the horse shook his head, gave a cheerful whinny, and seemed to feel better. He became quiet for the first time since Diggory had seen him. His ears, which had been laid flat back on his skull, came into their proper position, and the fire went out of his eyes. <laughs> "'That's right, old boy,' said the cabby, slapping Strawberry's neck. "'That's better. Take it easy.' Strawberry did the most natural thing in the world. Being very thirsty, and no wonder, he walked slowly across to the nearest pool and stepped into it to have a drink. Diggory was still holding the witch's heel, and Polly was holding Diggory's hand. One of the cabby's hands was on Strawberry, and Uncle Andrew, still very shaky, had just grabbed onto the cabby's other hand. Quick, said Polly, with a look at Diggory. Greens! So the horse never got his drink. Instead, the whole party found themselves sinking into darkness. Strawberry neighed. Uncle Andrew whimpered. Diggory said, that was a bit of luck. There was a short pause. Then Polly said, oughtn't we to be nearly there now? We do seem to be somewhere, said Diggory. At least I'm standing on something solid. Why, so am I. Now that I come to think of it, said Polly, 
But why is it so dark? I say, do you think we got into the wrong pool? Is perhaps this... Perhaps this is Charn, said Diggory. Only we've got back into the middle of the night. This is not Charn, came the witch's voice. This is an empty world. This is nothing. And really it was uncommonly like nothing. There were no stars. It was so dark that they couldn't see one another at all, and it made no difference whether you kept your eyes shut or open. Under their feet there was a cool, flat something which might have been earth, and was certainly not grass or wood. The air was cold and dry, and there was no wind. My doom has come upon me, said the witch, in a voice of horrible calmness. Oh, don't say that, babbled Uncle Andrew. My dear young lady, pray don't say such things. It can't be as bad as that. Ah, cabman, my good man, you don't happen to have a flask about you. A drop of spirits is just what I need. Now then, now then, came, came the cabbie's voice, a good, firm, hardy voice. Keep cool, everyone, that's what I say. No bones broken, anyone? Good. Well, there's something to be thankful for straight away, and more than anyone could expect after falling all that way. Now, if we've fallen down some diggings, as it might be, for a new station on the underground, someone will come and get us out presently, see? And if we're dead, which I don't deny it might be, well, you got to remember that worse things happen at sea, and a chap's got to die some time. And there ain't nothing to be afraid of if a chap's led a decent life. And if you ask me, I think the best thing we could do to pass the time would be to sing an hymn. <laughs> and he did. He struck up at once the harvest thanksgiving hymn, all about crops being safely gathered in. It was not very suitable to a place which felt as if nothing had ever grown since there, there since the beginning of time but it was the one he could remember best. He had a fine voice, and the children joined in. It was very cheering. Uncle Andrew and the witch did not join in. Towards the end of the hymn, Diggory felt someone plucking at his elbow, and from a general smell of brandy and cigars and good cloves, he decided that it must be Uncle Andrew. Uncle Andrew was cautiously pulling him away from the others. When they had gone a little distance, the old man put his mouth so close to Diggory's ear that it tickled and whispered, Now, my boy, slip on your ring, let's be off. But the witch had very good ears. Fool! came her voice as she leaped off the horse. Have you forgotten that I can hear men's thoughts? Let go of the boy. If you attempt treachery, I will take such vengeance upon you as never was heard of in all worlds from the beginning. And, added Diggory, if you think I'm such a mean pig as to go off and leave Polly and the cabman and the horse in a place like this, you're well mistaken. You are a very naughty and impertinent little boy, said Uncle Andrew. Hush, said the cabbie. They all listened. In the darkness something was happening at last. A voice had begun to sing. It was very far away, and Diggory found it hard to decide from what direction it was coming. Sometimes it seemed to come from all directions at once. Sometimes he almost thought it was coming out of the earth beneath them. Its lower notes were deep enough to be the voice of the earth herself. There were no words. There was hardly even a tune, but it was, beyond comparison, the most beautiful noise he had ever heard. It was so beautiful he could hardly bear it. The horse seemed to like it too. He gave a sort of whinny, a horse would give if, after years of being a cab horse, it found itself back in the old field where it had played as a fowl and saw someone whom it remembered and, and loved coming across the field to bring it a lump of sugar. A <laughs> fool! Gold, said the cabbie, ain't it lovely? The two wonders happened at the same moment. One was that the voice was suddenly joined by other voices, more voices than you could possibly count. There were, they were in harmony with it but far higher up the scale, cold, tingling, silvery voices. The second wonder was that the blackness overhead all at once was blazing with stars. They didn't come out gently one by one as they do on a summer evening. One moment there had been nothing but darkness, next moment a thousand, thousand points of light leaped out, single stars, constellations and planets, brighter and bigger than any in our world. There were no clouds, the new stars and the new voices began at exactly the same time. If you had seen and heard it, as Diggory did, you would have felt quite certain that it was the stars themselves which were singing. 
and that it was the first voice, the deep one, which had made them appear and made them sing. Glory be, said the cabbie. I, it, I'd have been a better man all my life if I'd have known there were things like this. The voice on the earth was now louder and more triumphant, but the voices in the sky, after singing loudly with it for a time, began to get fainter, and now something else was happening. Far away and down near the horizon, the sky began to turn grey. A light wind, very fresh, began to stir. The sky in that one place grew slowly and steadily paler. You could see shapes of hills standing up, dark against it. All the time the voice went on singing. There was soon light enough for them to see one another's faces. The cabbie and the two children had open mouths and shining eyes. They were drinking in the sound, and they looked as if it reminded them of something. Uncle Andrew's mouth was open too, but not open with joy. He looked more as if his chin had simply dropped away from the rest of his face. His shoulders were stopped and his knees shook. He was not liking the voice. If he could have got away from it by creeping into a rat's hole, he would have done so, but the witch looked as if, in a way, she understood the music better than any of them. Her mouth was shut, her lips were pressed together, and her fists were clenched. Ever since the song began, she had felt that this whole world was filled with a magic different from hers and stronger. She hated it. She would have smashed that whole world, or all worlds, to pieces if it would only stop the singing. The horse stood with its ears well forward and twitching. Every now and then it snorted and stamped the ground. It no longer looked like a tired old cab horse. You could now well believe that its father had been in battles. The eastern sky changed from white to pink and from pink to gold. The voice rose and rose till all the air was shaking with it. And just as it swelled to the mightiest and most glorious sound it had yet produced, the sun arose. Diggory had never seen such a sun. The sun above the ruins of Charn had looked older than ours. This looked younger. You could imagine that it laughed for joy as it came up, and as its beams shot across the land, the travellers could see for the first time what sort of place they were in. It was a valley through which a broad, swift river wound its way, flowing eastward towards the sun. Southward there were mountains, northward there were lower hills, but it was a valley of mere earth, rock and water. There was not a tree, not a bush, not a blade of grass to be seen. The earth was of many colours. They were fresh, hot and vivid. They made you feel excited until you saw the singer himself, and then you forgot everything else. It was a lion, huge, shaggy and bright. It stood facing the rising sun. Its mouth was wide open and in song, and it was about three hundred yards away. This is a terrible world, said the witch. We must fly at once. Prepare the magic. I quite agree with you, madam, said Uncle Andrew. A most disagreeable place, completely uncivilized. If only I were a younger man and had a gun. Gone, said the cabbie. You don't think you could shoot him, do you? And who would, said Polly. Prepare the magic, old fool, said Jadis. Certainly, madam, said Uncle Andrew, cunningly. I must have both the children touching me. Put on your homeward ring at once, Diggory. He wanted to get away without the witch. Oh, it's rings, is it? cried Jadis. She would have had her hands in Diggory's pocket before he could say knife. But Diggory grabbed Polly and shouted out, Take care. If either of you, if either of you come half an inch nearer, we too will vanish and you'll be left here for good. Yes, I have a ring in my pocket that will take Polly and me back home and look. My hand is just ready, so keep your distance. I'm sorry about you, he looked at the cabbie, and about the horse, but I can't help it. As for you two, he looked at Uncle Andrew and the Queen, you're both magicians, so you ought to enjoy living together. Hold your noise, everyone, said the cabbie. I want to listen to the music. For now, for the song had now changed. Yes, guys, Aslan has arrived singing a nice song to the sunrise. But like I said, that's going to do us for this evening. And I think it's quite a nice place to stop because like you're saying, Aslan has arrived and we're going to see how the story progresses from here on for the second half. Sort of we've set it up quite nicely. 
the witch is a very um the witch is really funny isn't it J jadin queen jadin yeah, terrible woman not very nice at all but i suppose it makes for a good um a good story i do as well dark fur i was just thinking that reading sort of how random it is that the cabbies just joined in right i mean of course you've got the main characters uncle andrew uh the queen diggory and polly but now you've got this random um cabbie old cockney cabbie and i'm i'm quite good at a cockney accent especially when it's written c.s lewis has written it in cockney as well so i can do that one quite well i like a cockney But yeah, guys, sorry, we're going to have to leave it there. But we'll be back tomorrow at half past eight, half an hour later than normal. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I'm glad everyone um, was able to catch up in, in the chat and, and chat, of course. And I always have to keep looking over if anything concerns me, but <laughs> it doesn't. Um, dark fur. I'm glad you enjoy it. Rosie Brown, a lumpy horse. Anyone else who's here? Um, Joel, Nicole, Julie, Samantha, Shefki, Alam, Sassy, everyone. Welcome and thanks for being here. I really enjoyed the first half of that book. And we'll be back tomorrow to finish it. So keep your eye out for the stream and I'll do another post. And we'll be back tomorrow for part two. So guys, take care. And if I don't see you, have a great week. Um, <laughs> no, no I, I don't know about that, a lumpy horse. It's about you guys. I'm just the voice. But yes, guys, um, Neutrino, lovely to see you. So guys, I hope you can make tomorrow at um, half eight but if not you can always watch it back on catch up so have a have a great week and Rosie's just uh, whetted our appetite saying the funniest part is coming tomorrow so Rosie's clearly a big fan of um, the magician's nephew and uh, I cannot wait to see what that funny part is Rosie so yeah hope you can make it see you all tomorrow and if not watch it on catch up and enjoy have a great week and I'll see you next time. Bye, guys. Take care now. See you.